So then I went to CC Urban, told them, you know, I've spoken to some hospitals, they liked it, they thought it could work. Um, can you, you know, will you pack this? And they said, yes. Just like that? Just like that. But there is a price to pay. Okay. The price is you have to quit your job. Uh... My father told me life is not a bit of roses. You gotta put your way to the path, do the work to smell the roses. This is Origins Africa podcast, where we explore the origin stories of people who have made and are making their dreams come true. Asking the how, the what, the when, and the why. I'm Oshaya, and on this episode, Tami Giwatsubosa shares her origin story and how an impactful encounter she had with Aisha in Kano in 2008 gave birth to LifeBank, a healthcare technology and logistics company. In 2016, Mark Zuckerberg, visiting Nigeria for the first time, referenced Tammy's work at LifeBank. Of her work, Mark had said, and I quote, If everyone had the opportunity to build something like this, then the world would be a better place. I've been to a lot of different cities. People around the world are trying to build stuff like that. If she actually pulls it off, then she will show a model that will impact not just Lagos, not just Nigeria, but countries all around the world. End of quote. And Tame has been on that journey ever since, solving Nigeria's shortage problem of blood and essential medical products like oxygen and vaccines. Today, LifeBank has saved over 7,000 lives and moved over 20,000 products with expansion plans to Kenya and Addis Ababa. But growing up wasn't without its challenges for Tami. As a young child, Tami lived on campus and had a pretty idyllic childhood. Yeah, we lived on the campus. Oh, okay. Um, my dad was um, a senior um, teacher or lecturer at the College of Education in El Arango. Okay. Uh, so it was a very kind of boring uh, mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. All the campus kids, for the most part, played together. You know, you know. now actually I'm not remembering. <laughs> uh, we had to like, whenever there's no water, we had to go to a particular stream. Um, and there was like a hill. Mm-hmm. Then you go down and then you go through like farmlands and oh. then you go to the stream. So it was like pure... A pure water stream where you can take the water and drink it right oh, okay. away from the stream. So it took a while. Like I, I remember climbing up the hill and climbing mm-hmm. down the hill, and all the little f- houses that okay. dotted the two path. If anybody who's lived in a college campus understand how they are all structured uh-huh. very similarly, okay. you have the neighbors in front and then the neighbors to the side. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know you all sort of like go to the similar kind of schools and mm. have similar lives and you play together and um, it's kind of like idyllic when mm. you're thinking about Nigeria. But all that fell apart when her parents were old salaries. There was a time, I think it was during uh, Babangida's administration, that you know my they were being hold a mm. ton of salary. Mm. So I remember I was having to move. Um, I really like my dad. I hung out with him a lot, so mm. I stayed. So the entire family moved to a different city. Oh, okay. Um, yes. You were my, the only one back home with your dad? Yeah, so I stayed with my dad for about a few months. Okay. And then he then moved okay. uh, to join the family. Where did you guys move to? I would move to Ileife, oh. where my mom could get a different job. Okay. And my dad could work in a different school. Okay. I had a bit of um, more um, services or could really actually help you Mm. while the government hold you. So Tammy and her family went through some form of enforced poverty. We weren't actually poor technically. Okay. 
Oh, my parents were being owed salary, so uh, it was sort of like an enforced poverty. I got you. Okay. So it wasn't that they didn't. You know, my dad had a PhD. Mm. He was a lecturer. Um, my mom was a t- English teacher. Mm. Uh, so in a normal country, they would be they perfectly would have been middle able class. To, okay. Yeah? Okay. So the poverty came because they were being owed a ton of like I think two years of salary. So wow. You imagine working and having no income, and you have six children. Wow. So is basically like enforced poverty mm. that came out of nowhere. Mm. And so anytime there's like a strike, particularly with, you know, Asu, I always feel, you know, a sense of um, understanding. Because you had been there, you had I, lived I had been it. There. It was basically enforced poverty mm. in our little family. And um, that's where we go to the bread, bread food when we moved. So we had to move from Ila where there was no opportunity whatsoever. Mm. Um, my father's father lived in Ilefe and had homes in Ilefe. Okay. Um, so we were able to move into his home. Okay. Um, into in my grandpa's household mm-hmm. he had died but he has, the, whole, the house was still just basically empty okay. uh, so which allowed you know us to be able to you know have some sort of like you know reduced when you have poverty um you don't want to be homeless so mm-hmm. when when there's sort of like a homestead somewhere in Lafayette we were able to move them okay yeah. And having to eat bread for it for breakfast, lunch, lunch and dinner. dinner. I how cannot this, stand How did the younger you then process it? If you bring it in a room where I'm, I, I would gag because uh-huh. now, like, I think the, 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 the consequence of having to eat the same, you know, fruits, you know, day in, day out. Is it a fruit? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> it may be it's an edible substance. <laughs> <laughs> <We hope. laughs> um, yeah, so like I just cannot take the taste of it. Mm. I remember in the, for breakfast we would slice it and eat it with stew, kind of mm. like a uh, yam. Mm. For lunch we would fry it. For dinner we'll make it into like a paste mm-hmm. and eat it with effort, mm. uh, which is vegetable stew. Okay. Um, and that was literally my life for. Almost a year. Wow. So think same about thing. Same every thing. day. Breakfast, for a lunch, year. dinner. And then we had to use those like uh, a batcher stove, I think they're called, where you sort of like pack sawdust. Mm, mm. Like those, those, the people who grew up in Lagos may not understand this. Uh-huh. But those of us in like in the interlands, in the in the southwest, we had this a batcher stove. So it's like a the stove is made of steel and then you pack sawdust into it and then you put wow. like a fire inside it. So as the sawdust sort of like slowly uh, catches fire, it heats up whatever you put on mm. it. Um, so we, I remember like also uh, a memory is going to um, going to like um, wood, you know, wood shops okay. and buying stacks and stacks and packing them into uh, into sort of like those uh, white uh, bags that you oh, put okay, food stuff okay. in, uh, packing sawdust and like carrying on our heads and going home because that was how we got, you know, we couldn't afford gas or we couldn't oh, afford kerosene okay. and we couldn't afford, you know, not even like firewood, mm. right? <laughs> you know, so we had to basically rely on this uh, sawdust. Wow. So I really lived... You know, and those are still memories that, mm. that stay with me. And I also know, I, I think another part of that sort of poverty is basically because it was enforced, because it wasn't, exactly. it wasn't that my parents were mm-hmm. not educated. It wasn't that they didn't do the right thing. And it wasn't they that they weren't hard working. Exactly. It wasn't they were that doing they, the exactly, work. They were doing the work and weren't being paid. So I'm always sort of like, I... I you know, that sort of poverty kind of changes you. Mm. Um, maybe sort of like enforces a sense of um, wanting to control your own destiny mm. um, and um, wanting to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Mm. Yeah. Wanting to control your own destiny, do you mean like having your own company and not working under I someone? Know. I don't know, but just there's a sense of yeah, there's just, I've always felt a need uh, to be in Being control. control. Yeah. Mm. Perhaps it comes from that. I don't know. Mm. You know, I'm you know, not a psychologist, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure a psychologist will tell me that, you know, it comes from that. But there's always, always been a sense of wanting mm. to control my mm. destiny and wanting be to the be mercy in control. Of someone. Exactly. But by some stroke of luck, when Tammy was nine years old, 
her mom won a lottery to the United States. At that time, we were, yeah, we were still living in Lefe. And uh, so my mom had a, a nephew uh, who lived in the U.S. And her nephew was... Um, you know, really loved. She helped raise him. She was sort of like his babysitter when he was growing up. Uh, so he felt he remembered her, and they had a close bond. So when this opportunity, and this was a common thing Nigerian did, you know, at the time the visa lottery to the US was kind of like how we treat Canada now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. at the time, so he had put her name into the lottery, and he had been putting names into the lottery like for years, mm-hmm. and no family member ever won. And it wasn't just my mom's name that they put. They put all the family members' name into it. And they put her name, and she won. Wow. I remember the entire family being, like, really mm. kind of, like, not into mm. it. <laughs> but then she won. And it was really incredible. It was one of those lucky breaks that mm. happened in your life. Um, I like to think that I would still be this awesome, you know, regardless, <laughs> <laughs> regardless of what happens. Uh. But, you know, I think it was a lucky break. Um, mm. It was a lucky break that allowed our family to ex- escape this mm. endemic poverty mm. uh, that doesn't come from the fact that they're not hardworking, but that comes from the fact that you have a poor government. Mm. Yeah. Also, um, in, another interesting thing about the story was, uh, so she had won it, and then she had kept it under her pillow. Yes! <laughs> because... I think she had won it and she had like reached out to some people okay. and they told her how much it would cost. Mm. And my dad was like, nah. Oh, you know, okay. he really loved his job, was a professor, you know, he was well respected. I mean, although there was no money, but mm. you know, he was highly respected in the society. Um, and, you know, he was, you know, he felt like they could figure it out mm. here. Um, so she just, she decided she put it away and, and that was it. I don't know what was the catalyst and, and I may have to ask her, but there was something that forced us to go get the letter. letter, it was a letter. Mm. So she, she the, the way I remembered it is she brought it out and then she called an uncle who was related to my dad. Okay. And, and he was, he lived in Lagos and, and was a lot more, um, had a bigger life and had a sort of like a, a more cosmopolitan life. I think he had been to the U.S. a few times. Uh, my parents had never left, you know. Mm. My dad had never left Nigeria. Okay. Um, my mom had gone to, you know, some Francophone country because she okay. studied French and English. But um, none of them had traveled outside Africa at this time. So they couldn't really, like, conceptualize uh, what this thing would mean. Uh, but the, the uncle did. So he's like, oh, my God, you're sitting on this. Like, all, the, all, the, all my mom's family knew, but my dad's family didn't know. But, but by him, by her calling him, okay. then they sort of started like, whoa, whoa. You know, you're sitting on this incredible opportunity and you're doing nothing. And she mentioned money and it's like, don't worry, mm. don't worry. Um, so then they decided that, you know, there was eight of us in the family. I think that was one of the considerations as yeah. well that, you know, how do you move eight people from Lagos tonight? You know, even in this, I mean, from Nigeria to the U.S., even in this time frame, it would be incredibly difficult true, uh, true, to do. True, true. Even if you had money, even true, if you had assets, it's, it's still hard to mm-hmm. move six children. Uh, so then it was decided that they would move the first four kids. Uh, sorry, rather, first the first three, three kids. Um, and then, so five people went from the family. How did the um, nine, ten year old you process this then? Did you feel rejected, unwanted? What emotions did you feel that? I, I think that when they were leaving, okay, you didn't really like, it wasn't something that I thought about. I was okay. nine. Mm. And they were not, I understood the process of decision making. So they had explained it, they had to, explained you. it okay. to us. Um, I'd also lived with my grandma. Okay. before uh, grandma she's sort of like she she's my grandma but she's technically an aunt but she mm. raised my mom okay um so i think i'd like yeah like i think i think that there, there's probably a little bit of that mm. you know there's a little bit of that um particularly when you compare yourself with your siblings we've got mm. to go mm. yeah i never once doubted my parents love for me okay um but then you didn't compare yourself to the people who got to, you know, live and, and I think that's, that's, 
if anything, that's where that that's where I would say that a twinge comes mm-hmm. from. Mm-hmm. This idea that other people were going and you were not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not that my parents were abandoned. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think that there's a bit yeah, I think there's a little bit of that as well. Um, where you just feel like, you know, I had to live with family members who were not the most um, loving or open folks. And, you know, all of that you know, stays with you. Mm. Um, I think for me, I'm highly independent. And I think that comes from that, that early break okay. in, in um, the bonding relationship with, the, with parents. Mm. So when you don't get, when you don't have a parent for five years, you learn to rely on yourself mm. and to rely on yourself for not just for, I mean, they did the right thing. They sent, you know, they made sure we were well cared for. Okay. Um, so it wasn't like, ooh, Were you in I, communication with them? Yes. Or, we okay. spoke to them every Sunday. So okay. there was communication. But, you know, there's only so much emotional um, support mm. and emotional um, care, care that you could get from the phone. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so I think there's a little bit of that where, you know, you just end up relying on yourself for emotional well-being. Uh-huh. Um, I think it also probably brought out my really horrible um, introversion much uh-huh. earlier because then, you know, you're a part of a big family and then all of a sudden you're like a lonesome, a, a, a one-man uh-huh. army because uh-huh. my, my two siblings were still with me, um, but they were much younger. Um, I was eight years younger, older than the next one. Wow. So it was a wide age gap. So you, I didn't also have a sister that, you know, you could share the burden and share your thoughts with. Mm. So it was just me and a three-year-old. Yeah. I also and, learned you had to become an adult quickly. So yes. yeah, because you had to be the parents to them. Exactly. Um, going to the PTA exactly. meetings and yes. speaking them from school. Yes. Um, yes. So I, I felt like I, I was telling my, you know, I was telling someone recently that, you know, I've been a mom for mm. since I was ten. Wow! And um, so being a mom now, it's it's not something that that's new, mm. you know, because it's this exact same process, basically doing emotional and physical labor on behalf of someone you love, and that's something I've been doing since I was ten. Looking back, would you say? Um had you maybe one time or did have thought that maybe your childhood was taken from you or you didn't exactly have a childhood? You know, that's something you you say when you're like well fed and American. <laughs> 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 you know, you, you don't, I don't think there's a ten year old who, who no matter what's be like, oh my childhood. No, but I said looking back now. I mean looking <laughs> back, yes, yeah, that's the reality. Um, I stopped being a child. You mm. know, I don't think that they took it. I, I just, when I was 10, I stopped being a child and that was it. Mm. And I think it happens to a lot of people. If you lose a parent, um, you know, if parents lose jobs, you know, if something major happens to cut off the life you've known, um, you just basically stop being a child and mm. it's traumatic. Uh, there's a lot of trauma there. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I had to go to therapy. Mm. You know, I, I went to, I, I mean, these are not things that you can just gloss over mm. um, there will be consequences in, in your life you would not have very good relationships mm. if you have major traumas that mm. you've not dealt with mm. so when I was about uh, 22 I went to I went to therapy oh, and okay. dealt with a lot of those things so now I can talk about it in, in less like there's a distance because mm. I've dealt with it okay yeah okay um, and you know it's just you know your, your childhood you know um yeah, you stop being a child. Exactly. You, you just stop. Because before then, there's someone you can who's responsible for you, for your emotional well-being, for your physical well-being, for your oh, And you can play, well-being. you can be carefree, you can play, you have you all, you can be all the You can have feuds. I used to feud with my siblings. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, three of them, they were like, sort of like a gang against mm. one of me. Mm. Uh, which is probably why my total account looks like <laughs> what it looks like now. I, I'm in feuding for day one. Um, so I used to feud with my siblings, and um, and that's what you do when you you know you have siblings and, and mm. you're a child. Mm. Uh, and that all stopped when my parents left. 
After five years of Timmy's parents working two to three jobs each, they were able to get a house in Minnesota, make a much better life, and return for Timmy and her younger siblings. Um, so going back or going to the U.S. and reuniting with your siblings mm-hmm. and your parents, mm-hmm. uh, was I strained at the beginning? Oh, that's actually where I don't think there was much of a problem while I was in Nigeria, but there was a lot. Oh, there was a lot after that. Um, when we got to the U.S. first, my mom, of course, she's the mother of the younger two, but so was I. Ah, so, okay. so there was a lot of struggle mm. in who is their mom. And she and I had a lot of fights, wars wow. over the two children. Um, mm. And I, th- I think that was actually the big adjustment. You're 10, you became the primary mm-hmm. caregiver of these two kids. Mm-hmm. You're 15 and you are now been asked to become a child again. It wasn't, it wasn't so much the process of what was actually hard was not the process of losing your childhood. That's why I think mm, when you were mm, talking about it, I didn't really see it that way. Mm. The difficulty was getting back to becoming a child. That was a, it was a quick switch, you mm. know. You're alone. They are young. They assume the responsibility. They look up to you. You're their sibling. So you mm-hmm. naturally offer that mm-hmm. care. Maybe I, I'm just not. Maybe mm. it, maybe it was easy for me. Mm. But what was really almost impossible was the switch. Until I went away to college, we were still having that struggle. So then, when I was 17, I went away to college and I left home. And I think that was what helped heal mm. um, the relationship. And after college, I went to therapy. So that's that's the story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the process of letting go of the maternal feelings on those two children was really, really almost impossible. It was impossible. Mm. Um, without that distance that college provided, I would right. not have been able to do it. What about yeah. reuniting with your older siblings? That was just, there was nothing. Like, we just Did you guys basically, bond? Or it was basically... No, we just started um, a few days again. Had... I mean, really, oh, like, okay. the relationship has been a few days, like, since day one. Okay. So nothing really changed. We were okay. just, we just, we're still feuding till today. So, like, at any given okay. time, I'm That's feuding great. with one That's of great. them. So, I think, mean, like, that one was actually pretty easy. My dad and I still bonded. Nothing. It was, like, the... the and my mom and I also bonded. Mm. But it was just that process of, these are my children. I'm mm. like, nah... You know, that sort of thing. And mm. it, it was never, you know, Nigerian parents don't also, unfortunately, Nigerian families don't talk about feelings. True, true. Perhaps if the feeling and all of these things I'm telling you, what, I was not aware of it at the mm-hmm. time that that's what's going on. But it would be, you know, she would scold them. I would go into a rage. Do you understand? She would make decisions. Without consulting you. Angry. Mm. She would... He would decide what they were wearing mm. in the morning. And I would be just so Leave upset. It. And any maternal decision she wanted to make about them, I was happy for her to be my mom. Like, so it wasn't yes. about her mothering me. It was about mothering those are my kids. Mm. Back off. Wow. And, and she's like, no, those are my kids. <laughs> like, you back off. You're a child. I'm your wow. mother. Um, and I think that was, that was the issue. That was mm. the issue. Like she, she'll literally be like scolding one of them and I'll get in front of them and put them back mm. to my back. I'll push them to my back and stand in front of her, like looking at her, like now what, you know, it was sort of like, it was, that was, that was a big adjustment. And mm. I think the distance helped and, um, we have a very great relationship now. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And a green up, you had hard, um, your career interests had evolved. Mm. There had been different switches mm. from wanting to be a lawyer at 10 mm. to um, the consciousness of being African and mm. wanting to be Nelson Mandela. Yes. And yes, then yes. You, there was the UN ambassador mm. program mm. that you mm. went for Kofiana. to the yes. maternal yes. healthcare yes. interests, you know, yes. developed. Um, could you talk about these different career switches right. and uh, more importantly, the light bulb moments or the mm. epiphanies mm. that drove each of those career switches? I think that I am the sort of person that sees someone. Okay. 
it doesn't matter. So a lot of people try to, and, and I think this is normal for most kids. You you see an example of a good life that you aspire to. I think because I basically lost that with my parents uh-huh. early on. I always look outside uh, okay. to people who are prominent people and basically aspire to whatever it is. Okay. I give them, not, it's not a prominence, but it's more like the the public respect and the the, the idea of giving back, being loved. Um, and the first person was Gani Fawa Amy. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was a huge fan. He was the biggest fan of this man. Uh, it listened to all his speeches. It listened to everything. So since my childhood, since since when I was aware of having a career, it had always been lawyer. And it was because specific, specifically tied around Gani Fawa Amy. Okay. So when I went to the US, uh, and I've always been rather fastidious. Um, my mom recently told me that when I was three, right, I, I, I was always um, introverted. Okay. So I didn't play with people. Uh, um, I didn't go out to play with friends. I I. I prefer to stay indoors. Um, I will organize the entire house over and over <laughs> and over and over again. Like I'll disorganize it, then organize it again. <laughs> and then not disorganize as in I'm playing now. It's this, no, like deliberately make, smash it up and then put it together. Constantly just putting things in order as a little girl. So it's always been like that. And um, so f- being having a fastidious personality by nature um i think has helped me okay because and i think what that does is i'm not particularly affected by my peers okay if you will so it was it's never i don't i've never sort of made it this like being like good at into like i'm not even there mm. right so and I've always been sort of like have clarity. I okay. always had clarity. Mm. And that's the interesting thing. The one time I didn't have clarity was one of those, was the worst two years of my life. And I'll tell you about it. Um, but yeah, like since day one, I'd always had clarity about wanting to be a lawyer. And once I'm clear about what I want, I attack it with everything I have. And I have the, my, and I think I got this from my mom. I have the capacity to work, mm. right? I enjoy working. Okay. As long as it's within the clarity and 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 tied to what I I, I do, uh, I was telling someone recently that running live bank is like a symphony. Like it's like mm. there's a music playing in my head. That's great. When I'm here, I am. This is at my. I'm at my best. Mm. I am at my most serene. I am just. You no know, work is wow. the easy thing mm. for me. So it's that organizing thing process okay. too. Uh, so I decided to be a lawyer. When I got to the U.S., I immediately got an internship at a law firm. Uh, there was a family friend who was a lawyer who uh, was Caucasian. She had a big law firm in Minneapolis. Um, every summer, every summer break, every midterm break, I'd go to there to to a law firm. Okay. I would not. I would take a bus, a public bus, just to get to Minneapolis. I live in a suburb. Okay. Um, I get to Minneapolis. I would just sit in that office. I wouldn't. I'm not doing much because. Mm-hmm. I'm 17 at this point, 16, mm-hmm, 17, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and 18 years old. So it wasn't like I was r- really adding value. But she would take me to court. I've mm-hmm. been to like at least I'm, I've been through four trials. Wow! You know, in the US, she would take me to court. She would. I remember I went to. She was a, thankfully she was family law. She okay. Did, she she was family lawyer. So it was mostly like divorce and mm-hmm. and you know you know custody etc. Those sort of thing. But she would take him take me to court. You know. And I learned everything. And Nancy is her name. She recently okay. visited me in Nigeria. So we kept uh, in touch. Okay. Um, but I I had taken my first year, my freshman year in college, I took, you know, um, um, I took LSAT. LSAT is the entrance exam into into the to the law school in oh, the okay. US. So that fascination was part of this whole thing. And then, and it was always centered around Ghani Fawaymi, Ghani Fawaymi. Uh, anytime I thought about who I wanted to be like, it was always Ghani Fawaymi. And then after that, um, I went to college. First, 
I think it was a sophomore year in college, a sophomore junior year in college. So freshman is year one, sophomore is two, junior and then senior year. So in my in my I think it was sophomore. Um, I um, basically started Model UN. So Model United Nations is a club in, in our school. Okay. Um, mostly, I studied political science because you, you can't study, there's no pre-law uh, in undergrad for in, in the US. You basically study whatever you want, then you take the LSAT. Okay. Usually you want to study political science. Mm. That's probably why a lot of American, <laughs> like a lot of American <laughs> politicians are lawyers. Uh, so you study political science and then you go to law school and okay. that's how you become a lawyer. Or you can do psychology. Some people do psychology. Okay. Some people do English. Mm. Uh, but it's usually around that, like, uh, liberal arts uh, degree. Okay. So I was studying political science. and Any particular reason for choosing it? Oh. Political science? It was just, you know, there was no reason. Okay. I didn't really care about politics. Mm. It was never about the politics of so it. It was law school. I mean, it just was just law like, school. Like, like, you know, it's like, I actually started with psychology, but it was okay. hard. Ah, uh, okay. So I switched to political science. Like, my first... Term, okay. it, two term in college was psychology, and then they were like, like, you know, you have to do like psychoanalysis. We're learning about <laughs> Freud and all this. I was like, no, nah. like, nah, bro. <laughs> like, I'm not interested. No, like, thank you, <laughs> but no thanks. Um, so went to political science, and okay. the political science kids were like international. Okay, so I think there was something about my school that was a bit different, like. Most of the, so we had Japanese students in the political science department. Mm. Psychology were all like, you know, Caucasians. <laughs> you know. And then the business, so it was either the business school or the political school. Oh, or the okay. sort of like international school that had like people of color. Okay. So, and I wasn't trying to be, you mm. know, I wanted to go hang out with my mm. friends, you know. Mm. So I decided on the international school, which political science was sort of like the biggest uh, okay. degree for international. You either do international relations, but we were all always intertwined. Okay. So I did political science. I didn't do international relationship because at the time I didn't want an international career. I was going to be an American. You know, I was going to have like, you know, the 2.5 kids, the American <laughs> dream. That was the plan and be a lawyer. So anyways, I didn't model UN because that was what all the cool kids in political science did. did. And we got to travel. So model UN, there was a major conference in the in the Midwest okay. of all the universities, model UN clubs. There was a big conference and that conference was always lit. You know, yeah. you could bring drinks. <laughs> And in college, that was the end thing. Okay. In the US, you have to be 21 mm-hmm. to drink. Mm-hmm. And um, we were all not 21. But, you know, the UN, the conference was known for being able to sneak in. Because <laughs> the ones who were 21 will bring in and then we all hang out and then we all drink. Anyways, so I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so <laughs> I joined the World of UN and my life changed. Mm-hmm. Um, and my life changed because I was... F- I basically became aware it's going to sound so ignorant and so American. As I'm thinking it, I'm trying to like say, let me say this in a different way. But I basically became aware of Africa's plight. Mm -hmm. And all of my life, even while I was in Nigeria, I wasn't African. I was Nigerian. I was Mm -hmm. not even Nigerian. I I don't think that... Nigerian kids conceptualize themselves, particularly when you're living in like interlands, as Nigerian. You think of yourself as Yoruba. Yeah? So I was Yoruba when I was living in Nigeria. Until Mother UN, mm. I became first African and then Nigerian. But mostly African. And as an African, and you're you're like in the Mother UN, you're Mother UN basically means you're creating mini UNs. So I was the honorable representative on the uh, social and economic um, committee of, you know, Kenya or of Morocco. And then the job is to write uh, resolutions and write all of these things and submit it as a UN. And then you debate it. If your resolution is adopted, then you get an award. That's that was that's what model UN. And we all literally we sit in a hotel that's designed to look exactly like the UN General Assembly. And so it's like our General Assembly. Then we have debates. We break out. Then we come. All the representatives come. They give speeches. It's like just General Assembly. You're basically recreating it with college students. 
um, so then I, the first time I represented Kenya, no, either Kenya or South Africa, I can't remember. And I was in the social and humanitarian uh, committee and we were writing uh, an article about hunger. That was my first understanding of hunger in Africa. I, I was not aware of it. I didn't know that it was a thing. And I started researching. I had found out about like famines and etc. And I was really taken aback and shocked. Um, the next year, I was um, I was inexplicably representing Greece, and again the social and humanitarian. And I did HIV/AIDS, and that was what my resolution was about. And I won uh, because my resolution was adopted. I was. I was selected as a special rapporteur. Mm. I didn't before this. I didn't think I was a leader until I got into until I realized I'm not a leader in my life. There's some people who everywhere they go, they rise to leadership. Mm. Yeah, that's not me. What I am a leader is if I care about mm. something. Okay. If I happen to if if I'm involved, something you're in passionate it, if, about. I don't want to use passion like okay. if. You, if he, if he sort of like speaks to me, then I will speak out. And then the introversion, all of that just Fits falls apart. Okay. If you come, if you put me on a stage and you ask me to speak about something that's not life bank, I will struggle. Because, and if you, it's like, it's like how, you know, sorry, I'm going to use a really weird thing, but Beyonce, yeah? <laughs> Love her. The best thing <laughs> in the world. Oh my God. <laughs> So when she was like starting out, she had a character called Sasha Fierce. Yes. It was, it's literally Sasha Fierce and Beyonce. Tell me, myself, me, is a boring mom of two, you know, with very, with reading as an interest in organizing. Those are my two interests, organizing things I'm reading. Okay. Um, but me, passionate about something is Sasha Fierce. It's like you, you're putting me on a stage and I'm just hitting it, right? So I hit it, got everybody to pass my resolution, helped with all the resolution, and was selected as a special rapporteur. And it um, was fantastic. It was like the first time, first time that anybody saw my leadership. Mm. The next year, I applied to be student body vice president in my entire school. Lost. Mm. Mm. Lost to Travis Meyer. <laughs> Travis Meyer. <laughs> I lost to Travis Meyer. <laughs> and um, I just basically now was like just inspired to, to leadership. Then my brother had a book. I went home for the summer and my brother had a book as um, A Long Way to Freedom. Oh, no, uh, a Long Walk to Freedom. Uh-huh. I, either it was my brother or I got it to the library. One of those two things. And I'm like a reader. Mm-hmm. I read, ooh, I read everything. Okay. I love reading. I adore reading. So anytime I'm on holiday, I just look for books anywhere. And I was always like, oh, I was always having to pay the library. We are local libraries in the mm-hmm. US. Okay. I was constantly late. Oh my God, late fees. Oh my God. All my summer money went to late fees in the library. <laughs> All I ever want to do, the joy, the joy I've ever, like, the, my most joyful moment is walking into a library. That's cool. After walking, sometimes I used to walk from home to the library, which okay. was like about a 30 minutes walk. So it'd be really hot outside. Um, but then I'll enter that library and I'll still have those books. Fiction or not fiction or both? I don't care. Okay. Anything. Non fiction, biographies, fiction, oh, romance novels, uh, spy novels, anything. Give me anything, I'll read it. So anyways, um, found Long War for Freedom, read it, and I was captivated by this man. Mm-hmm. Here was this man who gave his freedom for his people. And he seemed ordinary. And I think that was what was interesting about Nelson. My son, we, we named him Nelson. Uh, uh, his middle okay. name is Nelson. But what was so interesting about Madiba was that when he was the book, it made him seem ordinary uh-huh. in the beginning, like me. He was simple. He was, um, I believe he was taken from his home about the same age when I was, oh, when my parents okay. left. He had to go live with an uncle, just like I did. 
um, he seemed to have the same wounds and yeah. the same, and he was a lawyer. <laughs> so just pursue it so together. It was just like, oh my God. Okay. This is who I want to be. Mm, okay. Not this is who I am. Like, this is who I can't be. And that was it. And that I threw myself into international. I, I didn't switch my major because I was a junior this time. Okay. I threw myself into international relations. I studied everything that there is to study. Um, I wrote articles. I joined the, the clubs, all the international clubs, became president of one. Um, and again, if something captivates me, I'm happy to switch. Mm. I'm happy to leave law behind. I was very happy to leave law behind, although I'd been working on it for so long. But here, here it was a new dream. Switched my entire life, went international, graduated um, in four years. And then the confusion began. Mm. So these two years after graduation and before I went to graduate school were the most confusing two years of my life. It was because it was it's the first and only time I've never had clarity. Uh. And I think what happened was I basically woke up one day and I felt in my soul that I needed to decide. Uh. I needed to decide whether I was going to have an international life or an American life. Funny enough, when I read um, Barack Obama's um, biography, okay. it talks about the exact same thing mm-hmm. happening to him. Basically, the process of having to decide he ended up deciding to have an American life. I decided to have an oh, international life. life. And it was the worst, I think it was about 18 months. It was the worst 18 months of my life. I did odd jobs. I didn't really have direction. I was really sad. I was living at home with my parents. Um, and one day I just decided, okay, you're going to have an international life. And that's enough. And that's fine. How did you decide? Books. Okay. Um, I read books. Uh, I seem to recall, this is going to sound really ignorant. Like every time I think I'm saying this, I was like, I read a book called Eat, Pray, Love. Eat, Pray, Love. Eat, Pray, Love. Eat, Pray, Love. Okay. Have you heard of it? I think so. Oh, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, it's a good book. Okay. Uh, It's about a woman who was in search for herself. Okay. And um, went to three countries in the world, went to Italy okay. um, to eat, went to India to pray, and went to Bali to love. Interesting. And uh, so she wrote this book. Have you read it? No. Um, <laughs> it really nice. so American women were like oh, on oh, it. They okay. loved that. They mm-hmm. loved her. Mm-hmm. Um, her name is Elizabeth Gilbert. And uh, so she wrote this book. I read it. And I decided, well, Italy, India, Bali, Bali. Africa. She didn't write Africa, but I added Africa. So uh-huh. it's, it's like, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I uh-huh. want to see the world. I want an international life. And at this time, all the Model UN training came to fore. At the time, the head of Model UN was a Ghanaian. Okay. Um, what's his name? What's his name? The Secretary General of UN? Secretary General Kofi Annan. of UN. Kofi Annan. Okay. Thank you. Kofi was the, Mr. Annan was uh, the Secretary General of the UN at the time. And I was like, this is it. I'm going to be the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, That's okay. it. That's the new goal. <laughs> right? So, so from I, lawyer Ganifa, what you mean? So, so it was Nelson Ghanifa Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Nelson uh-huh. stayed. I never left it behind. Where and Ghani also stayed because I think the lesson that I learned from every one of them stayed. Okay. Ghani was a public defender. Mm. So it's, you can see parts of this true, in what I do. True, true. Um, Nelson Mandela sacrificed mm. for his family. That's why I'm still Most in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, sacrificed for his country. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm still in Nigeria. This is my sacrifice. This is my, <laughs> not to say Nigeria is a uh, urban island, but really. Gotcha. Not really? Gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> this is my personal urban island. Um, then Kofi Annan. And then Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan wasn't really personal. It was more like professional, like, okay, this is the job I could do. This is the job I'm going to do. This is like my next 20 years. Then I went to a grad school in California and left Minnesota, went to a grad school in California. The grad school in California is where you basically train for an international career. So you could get a master's in international relations, international growth, international business, public administration in a foreign language. 
excuse me, because in, in, in the US, you had to have, in the UN, you have to have two of the UN languages. Okay. So I already had English, I needed one more. So I chose French. Okay. Um, so I got my master's in public administration, but, my, but in French. Okay. Does that make sense? So I was taught in French. I wrote my papers in French. I still don't speak French. <laughs> so, how did is, you uh, do? How it work? I can write. Okay. I cannot okay. read. I can write. I can read. But you can't. I cannot speak. Mm. Which is funny. Yoruba is the opposite. I can speak perfect in Chile, mm. clear Yoruba, but I cannot write it and I cannot. I cannot read it. Okay. So, anyways, um, so I then um, finished my masters. I did it in. I did the first year was fantastic. I was taking classes. I was happy. I was living in California. It was beautiful. Mm. I was living in a city called Monterey. It was on the on the shore. Um, and it was like, you know, you can see the beach. Mm. It's beautiful. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, the weather was not too hot, not too cold. It was very close to San Francisco. So it was perfect. Um, so I had a great time first year. And then in the school, the motto of the school is that we'll send you out for one, you, you study for one year. Okay. The summer between year one and year two, it was two years okay. to masters. Masters in the US are two, last two years. Mm-hmm. So between year one and year two, you are going to go for the summer and go basically practice what we've taught you in year one. And then when you come back for year two, then you write your final dissertation or you do your final project. Mm. So then I chose Nigeria because at this time I was part of the blogger world then back in the days there was a big community of nigerian bloggers uh-huh. on blogger and we were all friends and they were all living in nigeria okay. and they all seemed to live interesting lives so i wanted to come back to nigeria um and then i met somebody off of blogger she was a blogger too okay and um she was really fantastic speaking my sister we're very close we talk all the time and then she was living in abuja so okay. she had connections with Diffid. Uh, she knew someone who What's worked DFID? there. DFID is Department for International Development. Okay. It's sort of like an Ameri- um, it's a British agen- UK agency okay. in Nigeria okay. as most concerned about international health, um, sorry, international development. Okay. So healthcare, education, security, etc. So the only open position was in a project. Now I've never thought about healthcare because I knew HIV because I did my UN project on HIV, but I never thought about healthcare. Didn't really want to be a healthcare person. All I wanted to do. Kofi Annan, Secretary Kofi General Anand. of the UN. Thank you. <laughs> Which really means you should be a generalist, right? You're not really like, you're not going to be an expertise in True. anything. So I really, would, I was like, okay, I need to finish this master's. I need to go to Nigeria. I'm going to have a great time for three months. Mm-hmm. Um, the only project that I could find a, 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 an internship in was a project called Partnership for Transforming Health System, okay. Part 2. And they had an opening in the health economics team. I did nothing about health economics, but okay, I'll go. So I went. And what they wanted me to do was not even actually health economics. They wanted me to undo. They noticed that I am good at organizing mm. again. So they're like, oh, this girl is good at organizing. You give her anything, she fixes and makes it work. Okay, we're going to send you to Kano, Jigawa, and Kaduna. Okay. We're going to organize our household survey hmm. because we're starting a new project and we need to do a pre-survey. What yeah? year was this? Can you remember? Is it 2007, 8 or 9? I think it's 8, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I okay. remember I, it's fine. I'm doing the math in my head because I remember I'm tw- I was 23 at this time. Okay. So now I'm 34, so that's 11 years ago. So what year is that? Mm-hmm. 11 years ago was 2009. So it's 2008. So 2008, moved down to Nigeria, went to live in Kano. My base was in Kano. So I, I was living in a, in a lovely hotel in Kano. I will go to, uh, to Abuja once in a while when I needed to get back to um, call my parents, etc. Uh, but I was mostly in Kano. And um, I was... Just living a normal life, I enjoyed it. I did the little hijab and mm. I fit in perfectly. It was fantastic. Uh, people were really kind to me. Um, so I really, I have great thoughts about mm. Kano till now. Um, and um, yeah, so one day uh, while we were doing now, so, so the house of it is you go to village after village after village, you ask people about their healthcare and what they think about it and how many people have died, etc. So one day we went to a village 
it was um it was during the day so usually it's the the men are in the field um you the women are usually at home like tending the household making the meals and so it was really rare to see a bunch of people standing in front of a hut so we, we then we saw the team saw a bunch of people standing in front of the hut so it was like oh this is what's happening there so we stopped had some people who said they were waiting for someone to die waiting Why? for someone to die waiting for someone to die what happened she's been in labor for three days the baby is not labor is not progressing they think the baby's hand is out mm-hmm. but nothing else is out mm-hmm. they don't have any money to get her to the hospital there are no cars in the village and they were basically standing around to see when she's gonna pack up mm-hmm. and this is day three She was about 21 mm-hmm. at the time. So she wasn't a child. But this was the first time that I would ever, and this is going to sound ignorant, but this was the first time that I would ever feel privileged. Mm-hmm. Privileged. Because often when you're young, you're really stuck in your own head. You can't really see outsiders. But entering this village in Kano and seeing and, and, and meeting Aisha Aisha was her name waiting to die for no reason something that a simple C-section could take care of mm. made me really feel my own privilege and made me feel shitty that's the best word for it mm. because I knew instinctively that there was no way that I would ever be in that position there was nothing I had done to make me deserve that knowledge and that there was nothing she did to put her in this situation. We were both Nigerian. Perhaps if I was not Nigerian, it wouldn't have felt that way. We were both Nigerian and we had come, we were both brought up in similar areas. I lived in a very small town and I had a completely different trajectory for my life than she does. She was stuck here and people were waiting for her to die. So I was really shocked by her story. I basically went back, you know, to my hotel, locked the door for three days. Nobody could find me. Mm. Um, Had a really horrible reaction to it. Cried and cried and cried. And I think it was one of those turning points. And that was how I became a healthcare person. Mm. I went back after the internship was over. I had a great time. They were really kind to me. I went back to California, finished my master's, changed the, I was like a man on fire. I was on fire. No No more coffee coffee around. No, this was now, you're going to end Matana death forever. Sorry. Wow. I'm very like, I'm (laughs) hardcore. (laughs) It was Matana hair. Matana death is not acceptable. And you're going to have to end it. Uh, so you need to learn everything you need to learn about maternal death so that you can end it. Uh, and that's what I did. I learned, I talked to anybody who would talk to me. I read everything I could find. Like I used to go partying, go drinking, no, all of that. I was like, because I was it. consumed. And then I went to, as I, I Six months later, I moved to um, Switzerland okay. to work at the World Health Organization. Again, fast, like I, I got things done. From I'm going to go to the UN to, oh, now I'm a healthcare mm. person to, okay, WHO is exactly where we're going because where else will you go? If How you did you get the, the WHO? Yeah. Uh, so went through a professor. Okay. Yeah, because the professors could see the change in me. Uh, so they connected me with the folks at WHO. Okay. And I went to WHO. It wasn't actually an internship, it was a fellowship. Okay. I was there for six months. Um, I wrote my dissertation about funding for healthcare. Because really, the reason why Aisha was in that scenario, as far as I was concerned, was they didn't have money. So we needed to fund healthcare properly. And maternal so, healthcare specifically or general healthcare? This, this one. Matana healthcare was a passion, okay. but I knew that it was going to be healthcare systems okay. uh, that I was going to build. Okay. So I, I worked at the health systems department at, at the World Health Organization. Okay. Uh, so that's what I did. Healthcare. So 
health systems funding specifically was what I wrote my policy about. And so my, my dissertation was institutionalization of healthcare funding. Okay. So I did that. And then a year later, um, after WHO, I went back to, to um, I went back to uh, Minnesota, worked at a healthcare company, um, health systems. It's called Fairview Health System, worked okay. there. And was sort of like doing Epic Care. Epic Care is a health software that's okay. used in the US, uh, like a um, medical information software. Okay. And um, I, I worked on it uh, within the Fairview Health System. Okay. After that was done, I um, got an opportunity to, I always, even though I was in the US for about a year and a half, um, I always knew I wanted to get back to Nigeria. No, Nigeria, just to Africa. Africa, okay. Where these things were happening. And to put so, an end to maternal death. And to end maternal mortality once and for all. Okay. That was literally the thing. Like, that's why I write on my journal, like, every year. You know when you get a new mm-hmm. journal every year? Jimmy must end, you know. Interesting. I was really, like... Yeah, I have issues. And <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's like you found your purpose statement. Yeah. As a 23-year-old in Kano, I found mm. my purpose. Now, stories don't make sense. It's when you're, in when you're living in, it, it doesn't, it's not really this tidy. Mm-hmm. There are ups and there are downs. There mm-hmm. reversal. It's only when you're telling it that seems to be tidy. So mm-hmm. I don't want anybody listening to, to this to think that they must live tidy you know, that their lives will be tidy in the way that I'm telling it. It wasn't that tidy. There were lots of doubts. There were a lot of moments where I wasn't sure. Uh, but once I became sure, I never, I didn't let anybody talk me out of it. I didn't even inform anybody. It was just my passion. So if you're not on the path to helping me gain my passion, I'm not going to speak to you about it. Uh, so I didn't want anybody to discourage me. I didn't want anything that like that to happen. So I think it's important, particularly for women, that a lot of times you want permission from the people you love and the people who are around you. You want your your boyfriend, your dad, your this and that, your mom um, <clears throat> to approve of the decisions you're making. Um, for it is your life. If you approve, then you must you must light yourself on fire and you must go the path that has been that 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 makes your heart sink, you know, that, that make the way I say it, that makes you come alive. Mm. And I came alive once I discovered maternal death and that this is what I was going to spend my life doing. So I then worked in, um, got an opportunity to live in Uganda for a year. At this time I had, I had met a guy we had dated for about a year right before I went to Uganda to work at, um, so it was a project between UNDP okay. and millennium, millennium villages project. Okay. Um, so I was going there for a year to work in, in a random, um, not random, in a, in a very nice town in, in Western Uganda. And um, my, my, my boyfriend at the time had proposed. I had said yes, but he knew I was going away for a year. So we we're going to say, we'll test it out. I had a great time. I enjoyed my time in Uganda. It was one great year of learning. Was it Montana Health Project? It was a health project. Okay. So I was required to, I was doing um, quality management for a, uh, for the Western district uh, in, in Uganda uh, to help improve health supply chain. Okay. So all the supplies you need to deliver good health care mm. to help improve it. That's what I did for a year. After the year, I knew I was never going to go back to the U.S. because I had a great time. This was mm. exactly what I wanted. Okay. So I talked to my husband, um, my fiance at the time to come to Nigeria. So, and I talked to my parents and I knew my mom was absolutely against this Nigeria thing. She still, she, now she understands, but then you're like, what is this Nigeria thing? We removed you from this country to get a better life, but you want to go back. Why? Why, why, why? So I said, okay, everybody comes to Nigeria. I'm getting married in Nigeria. Um. I'm going back after the wedding, but you all come. So she comes, I'm in Nigeria. I moved from Uganda down to Nigeria. My husband moves from the U.S. to Nigeria. He knew that we were not going back, mm. but my mom didn't know. <laughs> so they landed. They're like, oh, yeah, so when is the flyback? I'm like, so after the wedding, we got married. Everything was fine. My mom was like, oh, so when is the flyback? I was like, which flight? <laughs> it was not amused. It was unhappy, but 
you know, she's like, okay, whatever, you're crazy, you want to do whatever you want, you're always changing the class, and blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, fine, mom. Because I, I think she liked the lawyer daughter thing, like, she really liked it, but I had okay. grown and lived, and things were had changed. And then, like, even an incident happened, like, I think a, two weeks after we got married, you know, I was carjacked in Lagos. Oh. Yes, you know, and they, I, had, I had been kept in the car as insurance. And basically kidnapped for like wow. two hours. They drove me around. The car was finally switched off and then they had to run. And this process, um, my mom was like, oh, I'm booking your ticket tonight. Because she had not left. She was oh, still in Nigeria okay. for the wedding. She was like, oh, <laughs> We're getting back together. I'm booking your ticket tonight. <laughs> But you know, she's very, you know, unfortunately very patriarchal when mm-hmm. so when the husband said no mom, we're staying, uh, then she like cooled down, she she backed off. Okay. Um so we then stayed, um, had a good life, worked for Lagos State for a bit. Um, had a really I worked for the Office of Facility Management and Maintenance. We were doing How did you get the job? Twitter. Okay. How? So I, I, I was, at this point I was writing, okay. um, um, I wrote a, uh, you I had a an, blog or no, no, no blog. I wrote for, uh, uh, Y Niger oh, was okay. a magazine okay. at okay. the time. And I wrote a, a, uh, so there was a front page, uh, project they did where one prominent person in Nigeria would write an article, um, every week, okay. uh, every day of the week. Okay. Um, so people like Akin Yobode who now works at, um, at uh, who was in Lagos State government and then went to AKT State okay. government was part of it. We had a lot of different people who were writing. You know, I think Jafet Omojua oh, okay. was okay. part of it. So we were all sort of like Ibuka. I think was there Ibuka Chendu. Oh right, um, okay. So and I was one of them. The more more policy oriented mm, writer okay. and quieter. Um, so I wrote. So I was I was a little bit prominent um, at the time. Uh, so that's how I, I got the Lagos okay. State gig. Okay. So I worked with them for a year. And um, I, I basically led a team that did facility management and maintenance. So they would go around public facility like schools, hospitals, um, you know, uh, state stadiums, etc. And they go, I, I led, I was the operations manager. I led a team of uh, engineers, uh, going around checking the structures. Then once the structure is, is checked and we have the sort of like the purchase order that needs to be fixed, then I, I, I leave that, and then go to the next one. But I wanted to be more, I left that job. It was a great job. I enjoyed it, but because I, I really wanted to be in healthcare. Okay. And although we did hospitals, it was not all we did. And this was not what I wanted. Um. So I left. We're still very good friends with them. And um, I got a job working in Nollywood, Okay. Going in healthcare. How did you get this one? So this one actually just applied normally. Okay. Um, no, actually, a contact of mine sent it to me. Okay. A contact of Twitter actually sent me the job. So you told them you were um, open to new job opportunities. No, 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 no. So I was still, I was still um, at the at okay. the Lagos State when okay. I got the job. Okay. Somebody just said to me, do you know somebody in healthcare? Because I was known for healthcare at the time, okay. particularly in my writing. Mm-hmm. I always wrote about healthcare. Okay. Other things, but healthcare as well. Um, so then I, yeah, so I got a job. My job was to write, to figure out how to put health messages in popular Nollywood movies. So we'll get like, I don't know, wedding party. Mm. This is an example. We mm-hmm, didn't work mm-hmm. on wedding party. We'll get a, a movie like wedding party and insert some health messages that okay. you will not know that it's a health message. Mm. Then you watch it and then you get a, the message. Maybe it's family planning. Maybe it's you know testing malaria, coatem, okay. um, making sure you you test malaria before you treat it. So those sorts of health messages we we'll just insert it. It was a great job. It was fun. Mm. Um, you know, I hung out with celebrities on set all the time. I remember meeting Mama G and that was like, oh. really cool. um, <laughs> um, so I really like, I, I mean, I work with Tonto DK, all of these people. Mm. It was really great. Um, but I was pregnant at the time. Um, I went to the U.S. where my parents live uh, to do by my son. Um, and I was perfectly healthy. 
I remember still working. I, I have a thing for working. I remember the day that I caught my flight to the U.S., I worked. My husband literally had to come and drag me from, from Ikeja to drive me to the airport. Otherwise, I, would, I may have missed my flight. So I really like working. Um, and anyways, I went to the U.S. to have my baby. And I was perfectly fine. And, I mean, if you could show up at work, uh, you must be fine. And then when I got to the U.S., at this time, I was like seven weeks, seven months pregnant. Like almost like a week after, like almost a few days after I got to the U.S., all of a sudden, I went into early labor. Okay. The baby was very early. It didn't make any sense. Um, I be, I went to the hospital. I was rushed to the hospital. I was put on bed rest. Um, I had so many complications. I had gestational diabetes. Mm. Um, it's basically diabetes within birth it goes away after birth. Okay. Um, so I had the gestational diabetes. I had preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is uh, high blood pressure in pregnancy. Um, the baby was born early. Mm. Um, they induced me, and then the baby would not progress. So exactly what started this maternal health care. Um, Aisha's push, okay. Aisha's story. Peace. It must be God mm. uh, or the universe or whatever it is you believe in because it's really random for me to then have a breach birth mm. so I have the exact same issue that Aisha had happened to me and I was lucky and my privilege came up I got so I, I was in limbo for 26 hours um, it was everything was normal until 21 about the 21st hour then I got really sick, really sick. The baby was in distress now. But within two hours, I was already in, I already had a full team of surgeons. Wow. I had over almost 20 people in that room with me mm. because I had so many complications. So there was a lot of people like looking to make sure that everything was well. I had, I had a baby. Within mm. three hours of being in distress, mm. the baby was born. And... That is the same thing that Aisha had to wait for three hours, three days for. And I got mine in three hours. And that is the sign of, that it just shows you the power of a proper health system. Mm. I'm not rich by American standard. I am not special by American standard. I knew nobody. My parents were lower middle class, you know, in America. But I got all the services that I needed. Within three hours, baby was born. Um, I didn't have to pay arm and a leg. Um, we were in the hospital for 20 days uh, because he was born um, at um, at uh, 32 weeks. Um, so all the things we need, it just brought to relief uh -huh. the privilege that I had. And I remember when I was really getting sicker and sicker and sicker while in the hospital, I remember having a bargain with God that if I survived the birth of my son, uh -huh. that I was going to do something about maternal health care more directly. Uh -huh. So when I came back, um, you know, when I, I came back to Nigeria three months ago, three months later. Okay. Because this was six years ago. It's six now. It turned six mm -hmm. in February. And um, so when I got to Nigeria, I um, started talking to everybody who would talk to me about maternal health care. I'd already cared about blood. I really knew a little bit about blood at that time. But... Then I realized that the largest killer of women in childbirth is postpartum hemorrhage. Mm. So a mom gives birth and then she starts bleeding. Within two hours, within two, 20 minutes and two hours, she's dead. So it is the largest killer. It is the most catastrophic killer of women worldwide. So it's not just Nigeria, it's not just Africa, it's worldwide. And it kills the fastest. Mm. And the last bit is, so if Aisha had that postpartum hemorrhage, she would have been dead. There was no way I would have seen her because it's two hours and you're dead. Um, and it kills the most. And you can save nine out of ten women. Uh, so if you have ten women have postpartum hemorrhage, by just making sure blood is available, you can save nine of them. Wow. By blood just being present at the time when she starts bleeding. Uh -huh. um, that was it. 
I knew then and there that this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. Yeah. But、um, looking back, whilst、mm. you were pregnant,、mm. uh, because of the well, Aisha experience then、mm. that you had witnessed,、mm. did you at any point in the course of a pregnancy think that、um, perhaps you would have no? You didn't have that fear. No, I was young. I was. I lived in Lagos. I had a nice flat. I、mm. had a great husband. I had a car.、Okay. So I wasn't. Now I have fear, but then、mm. I didn't. I was, you know, sometimes you're still when you're young. I was 27 at the time. You feel a bit invincible.、Uh, um, mm. So I never felt like I was going to have a complication because throughout the pregnancy I didn't have any complication. Okay. Okay.、Um, there was not nothing wrong with me.、Um, I mean, I had other fears, but specifically on my life, I had fears about the life of the baby. Okay, that、I'll、was what、that. I actually feared, you know, because when you're, you know, a lot of women have miscarriages,、oh, etc.、Okay. So I feared for the life of the baby, but I didn't fear for myself. Okay. But then I was the one who ended up getting really, really sick.、Mm. Even the baby that was born 32 weeks, at 32 weeks, has been perfectly healthy his entire life,、mm. like perfection. Mm. I've never seen anything like it. Like he's maybe been he's been hospitalized once. And only because I'm his mom, and I'm really、mm-hmm. like anxious, um, and um, he's perfectly healthy. But it's me. So I was never worried. I was never anxious. I felt like I was gonna be fine. I was more focused on the child.、Mm. Um, but yeah, when I came back I, and I wanted to do this work, I talked to everybody in health in blood. I went around blood banks, hospitals, everybody that has to do with blood. I'll talk to them. What were you asking them? What's happening? Why、okay. is this problem there?、That's、Why are women dying so much? Okay, tell me the truth.、Uh, Did、so、you、I、get th- the truth? Yes, people were very open. Okay, maybe it's the accent. I'm not sure, but <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's my incredible grace and, and charm. I don't know, but people were very open to me and were willing to help.、Um, and.、Uh, Yeah, I found out that blood is a short shelf life product. You found out that blood is a short shelf life product. Okay, it lasts about six weeks. Okay, from the time it is、uh, collected, then it has been discarded, and our blood banks were discarding blood. Wow, that's step one. I knew that so many people were dying, so I thought, okay, we need to match supply to demand. That was it. That was four years ago.、Mm. No, that was about like five years ago. So when I thought my supply to demand, I、um, and I don't usually tell this story this way. But once I had the idea, my supply to demand, I was working at a co-working space at the time for the American company. Okay, I thought it was gonna be like a side gig.、Um, I never had any thoughts of starting a company.、Mm. Like I'm not like I've never inspired. Aspired to entrepreneurship in my entire life,、mm. like never once,、mm. ever, ever. It was always international career, solving problems, doing good things.、Um, so I got a, you know a developer who's actually downstairs、mm. to build something.、Uh, the first iteration of、um, Life Bank,、um, the Plus. And、um, you know, I remember shopping around, and people had some interest. Shopping around for、uh, the product, okay, to the hospitals and the blood、okay. banks. There was some interest, and then so you showed them the app that a developer. Showed them that developer had built. How did you convince him? Sorry. How how did you convince the developer? Oh, I paid him. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, I paid him. There, there was no business at this time. Okay, it was just something I wanted to build. Okay. Um, so I built it, and I was going around saying, "Would this work? Would this work?" Um, I'd not registered anything. Then I remember I was invited to something at CC Hub. Okay. And I loved what they were doing at CC Hub. I remember speaking to somebody who had built a company inside CC Hub. I was like, "How did it work?" She told me, "Oh, they give you money." If you have an、mm. idea, they give you money. Then you can start working in this office and build your business. I was like, "This is what I want." <laughs> oh my god! Because my husband, I've been telling my husband, I want to do this full time, and he's like,、mm. "No." And he gave me 
an idea. Is it? If someone else, I'm not sure about this idea, he said. If someone else backs it, mm. someone who's not you and me mm. backs this idea, then I'm going to fully 100,000% support you. And um, at that point, operation hadn't started yet. You had only spoken with her speeches, they were interested. They were not even using it, it was just an app that I had oh, built. Okay. That was it. Okay, so then I went to CC over and told them, you know, I'd spoken to some hospitals, they liked it, they thought it could work. Um, can you, you know, will you pack this? And they said, yes, just like that, just like that. But there is a price to pay, okay. The price is you have to quit your job. Uh, I was like, God, Jesus, no. <laughs> you know, I like the spa. Mm. Mm. I like eating out. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the spa. They mentioned the spa because I really like the spa. I like getting massages and being cared for. Do my nails. I'm very girly. I like all of those things. Okay. Um... So I really like having money, <laughs> you know, like I, I really, I was attached to having money. I had a, you know, 18 month old at the time and I had a family to take care of mm-hmm. and I was like, hey, good man, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, the job was a really great job because I was paid, so the, the, the Nollywood work was uh, by an American NGO called okay. Nollywood Workshops. I was paid like an American. Uh... In Nigeria, so I was paid in that's sweet. Your, your friends. <laughs> At the time, it was 200. <laughs> it was 200 to 1. Okay. I, I never would pull now, like, maybe if I'd been pushing more. It would be 400 to 1. I would have never, nah, it's happening. But I was paid well, because okay. you have to pay you know, an American well. Uh-huh. Um, and paid in Forex. And it was also because they didn't have an office here. It was flexible work. Uh like how sweeter can you have like the perfect job so like the evidence was like <laughs> why would you quit this perfect job like makes right. no sense but is he upset is this either the idea or the job wow are you gonna go after your dream or are you gonna stay in your comfort zone yes and I think you know it's really not this dramatic in real life <laughs> but it really was this dramatic they told me and they were gonna invest so it wasn't like going to zero it was we will invest this amount of money in this idea you have. We'll give you this office space. We'll give you our expertise and our experience uh, in building. Oh, you can keep your job and you don't get all of these things and you do it as a side gig. I chose Life Bank, clearly, yeah. because we're here today. Did you talk to your husband about it? Oh, of course, I talked uh, to my husband. What did he say? Of course, he thought I was crazy. Okay. <laughs> but everybody has always thought that. Like, every time I make this big... Mm. Anytime I get to this junction and I take a side and I, you know, is I might sort of like get to this point, decision uh, point in uh, my life, everybody around me has always thought, why are you so weird? Like, you know, uh, why, 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 why are you so strange? Normal people, why are you not normal? Um, and I think it felt like that, you know, anybody will feel like that. I mean, if you told me that, I would be like, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, like, so why did you choose Life Bank? Why? What helped with your decision making? <sighs> to be honest, to be completely honest, I had made a promise uh, on what I thought at the time was my deathbed. Uh, I had made a promise to do something about maternal death. Uh, this was the largest problem. This was the largest thing killing women in childbirth. Uh, and I had promised. Uh, had, the universe had put me, or God had put me in every place where I, all the help I needed had been provided. Uh, all the comments, all the reasons why I tell myself I'm not going to do it was being solved by CC Hub. Uh, it was startup capital. I was very conscious because I'd never worked before Life Bank, I'd never worked in a company. Uh, like I, I've never not not just run a company. I've never actually had a job in a company before. It was always like international organizations. No, 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 no. I had a job. I've had a okay. job, but it was always like international organizations and NGOs okay. and you know in a normal normal company like having uh, a job in a company. Gotcha. I've never done okay. it. I didn't know what they do, what people do in companies. I had no idea how you run uh, a company. Uh. So here was the CEO saying, okay, you can start it as a company. 
And I knew that I wanted it to be a company, not an NGO, because I believe at the time I had been part of a few NGOs that had died uh, okay. because they couldn't get funding. Okay. So I knew that sustainability was critical. If I'm going to make all the sacrifices, the business better. <laughs> it's going to work mm-hmm. and it's going to last. Mm-hmm. One. Two, the business, you know, and I'm not good at numbers. I never did math. Mm-hmm. So they sort of like the, the financial help that I needed was being, was being provided by CC Hub. There's startup capital. There's an office space from day one. So it had been made it really easy for me. And I felt like God was telling me, first of all, first I made you see Aisha. Uh-huh. You refused. You were doing it half hazardly uh-huh. constantly looking for money and looking for pleasure uh-huh. and fun and all that. Then I made you yourself go through it. And you're still uh-huh. saying, oh, but I don't know how to do this. Oh, but I don't know how to build a company. Third, I solved all that problem for you. So, yeah, what is the excuse now? Excuse. Like, what is the, what is the excuse now? Oh yeah, I don't want to. I want to make good money, really. So, I think for me, that's like literally. I feel like if you're agnostic and you're listening to this, and I used to be agnostic, um, it's hard to understand this uh. idea of God, this concept of God, but. I feel like it's either the God or the universe or something that's out there because it was outside me. Mm-hmm. Because it was up to me. I'll be like working for NGOs, feeling good with myself. And earning going forex. to spas. And earning <laughs> pure forex. It wasn't even sent to Nigeria. It was sent over there. You understand? So it was like no one can touch it. Like I was wow. good. I was good. So if it was up to me, if it was the human, if it was sort of like a human decision that had to be made, and if there was no God in the mix of this thing, I would have chosen the easier path. Mm. But it was like e- everywhere I went. Also, I was very, at this time, I had a big Twitter account and there was something that was happening. Every time someone died of blood related issues, mm. people would tag me on it. Wow. Like constantly, you send it as a DM, tag me. Send it to me like constantly. I was constantly inundated with the death. Wow. So it was like God was the universe was conspiring and God exactly, was. You understand? Like, they, this is the path. Mm. This is the consequence of you mm. not going through the path. Choose. You couldn't not say. I couldn't not choose it. I really couldn't do it. Okay. So I chose it. And I mean, this was what Ghani would have done. This is what. Nelson That's a Mandela coffee in it. This is the coffee you have done. <laughs> Do you understand? Like everybody you had ever looked up to, even mm. Nancy, the person who won the law firm, this is what she would have done. Fighting for the good cause. Fighting for a good cause. Do you understand? So I stayed, I built Life Bank, and to be honest, it has been both the best decision mm. and one of the worst decisions I've ever made equally mm. best because if you're walking up the stairs you see those names those hearts yes those are every life we've saved oh okay we wanted to remember I mm. or we <laughs> you know I think everybody agrees with me now but I wanted to remember because I'll come up here every day I'm Manager. doing business stuff mm. I'm doing management stuff mm. it's easy to forget True. the why True. but on that wall as I'm walking up I'm reading every name I'm mm. reminding myself this why. is why I'm doing this so no matter how hard it gets no matter mm. how difficult it is the why is always present and the lives we're saving is always present it's literally you're standing in the space between life and death mm. a mom a child who has malaria somebody who has sickle cell somebody who's doing just routine surgery, uh, somebody who's having heart surgery, somebody who's having kidney dialysis. Um, almost most people, the majority of people who enter a hospital will need blood. And they will die if they don't have it. There's no substitute. They have to get blood. There's no manufacturing. You have to get the blood. You have to get the blood. There's no way out. If you don't get the blood, you're going to die. Your body will stop working. That's it. That it really is it. And we, Life Bank, are standing in the middle of that. Mm. We say, to the God of death, not today. Mm. Right? And we are saying not today for thousands and thousands of people. And we've said not today for 70,000 people mm. in four years with very little money. So for me, 
it is the best decision because of the sheer amount of impact. It's the worst decision because it's been difficult. Difficult on me as a mother because mm. I'm working 14 hour days. Yeah. Difficult as a wife because, again, I travel constantly out there on the road because business is growing. It's been difficult financially because my income was basically shaved by like almost like on no like ninety percent, like no spa. <laughs> three years, no spa. I'm back to the spa now. But three years, I had no money for spa. I was like shook. Oh mm. my god, it was terrible. Mm. Financially, it was difficult. Emotionally, it was difficult because, again, I'm a sole founder. Mm. So all the issues around the business, and the business has almost died. Thousands, I, I would tell that story one day. It has almost died at least 10 times. It had almost died at every point. And just holding it all together and pushing. And I'm stubborn. I'm very stubborn. Like mm. I said earlier, once it's the thing, you cannot keep me from the thing. Mm. And this is the thing. All the things before then were precursors to this. This is the thing. Mm. I say that it seems like everything in my life, every study, every opportunity, every person I've dated, every person I've met, were all guiding me and pushing me towards so this fish. one direction, which is solve this problem. I mm. said, solve this problem. And once it's been solved, I'm going to get a house mm. in the middle of nowhere mm. with a spa attached to it. <laughs> And I'm going to leave my baby girl lifestyle, which was what was the plan all along. Awesome baby girl lifestyle. So I'm really waiting for that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the story. Okay. So um, you said yes to Sissy Help and they gave yes. you the space. Yes. They gave you the capital. capital. And the experience. And the experience. Yeah. So what did you do next? How exactly did you oh, start? Oh, yes. So... I remember stopping work temporarily in December 2015. That's a Nollywood work? Or which? Yes, Nollywood works. Okay. Workshops. Nollywood workshops. I stopped temporarily December 15. December 1, sorry. You couldn't tell them no permanently? No, exactly. So, <laughs> so how long did you yeah, ask for? One month. One month. Mm. Okay. So all of December... I, the first person I had to convince was the developer because again, this was supposed to be a tech company. Okay. It's a platform we wanted to build. Mm. So I called the guy who built it. This was like, I think a year ago. Okay. He had even forgotten. We are still, we were still in the same co-working space. We still saw each other every day. Mm. So I called him, AY, Alpha. He was working at it. No, no, we are not saying, he had left the company. He was working for other okay. co-working space. He had joined a bank. Okay. I was like, are you going to build this with me or what? He's like, no. <laughs> How much are you paying? <laughs> we laughed. It's like, bye. And then I said, do you know what's at stake? Like, oh, Timmy, you started with your see the word nonsense. Mm-hmm. And finally I convinced him. What did you tell him? him? I just said, I promise you I'm going to make this big. So it's not going to be, it's not just impact. It's not just altruistic. I promise you that I'm going to make this a big company. And you're going to get shares from day one. Mm -hmm. And we're going to build this together and we're going to make it work. And I promise you that I'll give everything to make it work. And he said, okay, those are good odds. And he agreed to start working. It was part-time, okay. of course. He, still, he, he worked three days a week in okay. live bank and two days with another company. Okay. Uh, because the amount we had at that time, couldn't even pay for mm. his fueling. <laughs> so, and that's how we built. By a year, he had become full-time because he, he was, at this point, oh, he announced okay. the impact. And it was How long did it take in. him to build it? Sorry? How long did it take him to build it? To build it? The- to build the platform itself? I think like because I built the first iter- mm-hmm. iteration so I think by January by end of January 2016 okay. so by end of December 2015 I knew this was it mm. are you bug, called Nollywood Workshop back until then and then Nollywood Workshop mm-hmm. so this was it so by January 2015 2016 I was full time was it just a platform that made you think this was it no, or had someone so what other was, stuff happened I don't know what it is but it was like not thinking about anything else okay but this for a month made me realize the sheer impact of it 
Okay. And I said, this is what I want to do. Okay. And I, I was fully, com- the conviction was not there. There was no more. And I now lived on very little mm. for, for that month. Mm. Um, and I felt like I could do it. I mean, my skin was not trash. <laughs> Ended up being trash. <laughs> but my skin was still, my skin was, I, I wasn't really feeling it at the time. I kind of felt it, no spa, nothing, you know, I was just buying lunch. The money I had was buying, just keep body and soul together and not be homeless. But, you know, that was it. Mm-hmm. That was it. So you have the platform, then what did you do next? Instead? Then we had to go to the hospitals. Okay. And I, a few people had joined us by the time. I think we were six at this time. Okay. Um, Who are the key people you employed? So I employed, um, Unfortunately, somebody that didn't work out, I think it lasted two weeks. We, no, two months. I employed, after AY, okay. who was a developer, I employed a community person to okay. do blood donor stuff because I thought that would be a big part of it. Then I employed a salesperson okay. uh, who will go to the hospitals with me. Okay. Um, I, I knew that I was going to do direct sales. Okay. I never tried to do um, like, you know, digital sales. No, mm. I knew it was going to be direct. Hospitals in Nigeria... Nigeria is still back, backwards in terms of tech mm. adoption and hospitals are worse. <laughs> um, was it to, was it to get the meeting set up or were you posted? No, we didn't set up. We just walked in. Oh, okay. We just showed up. <laughs> like, no, it was, it was like, that's, you know, I, I listened to a podcast before that says do things that don't scale. Mm. I basically had to do things that didn't scale. And mm. the way that I could do that was, Basically, show up at the hospitals. Just wake up in the morning with the sales team and show up in the hospitals and tell them just like bank. And were you allowed entrance or you were told oh, to well, come back? Sometimes we would stay the whole day and no one would answer us. Mm. Sometimes within 20 minutes, we already got an in, like got you know entrance into the CEO's office. So it was a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first break was the first blood bank that agreed to use life bank. So not even the hospital, not the, the hospital. blood bank. Because you know when you're building a marketplace that's dual, mm-hmm. supply first, I think, is the most important. Mm-hmm. Not demand first, supply first. Okay. Because if supply is present in a particular platform, mm-hmm. demand will come find it. I see. Was the idea. Interesting. So, and all of these things I'm saying, I knew at the time, but not the way I've said it. Mm-hmm. Of course, I, you know, the polish comes with time. <laughs> um, so in general, you have a platform. When yeah. did the first blood bank come? The first blood bank came by April. April. Mm, so three yeah. months, there are yep. about three, four months. Okay. But we weren't fully focused. We were still, so generally we had a good platform. By January, we also knew that we weren't going to be just a tech platform. Okay. That del- delivery was important. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so even from from February to all the way to end of April, we were also waiting for creating our distribution platform. Okay. Uh, so we had to get bike, you know, we had to get uh, the blood boxes. How did your idea turn out and decide that it was going to be... So literally we were supposed to be a a um, a tech platform, just a discovery platform. And then I think it was one of my team members and I went to a hospital uh, to basically tell them about our platform that we built. And I remember the hospital said, oh, yeah, that's good. But how do we get the blood? Ah, okay. I mean, it's good to find out where the blood is. So is it going to, you know, when you going to appear in the hospital? Like, okay. What? Like, oh, do you work with a delivery network, etc." Uh, I was like, okay, okay, we'll go find a delivery network. Okay. Because everybody, nobody was doing on demand. Mm. At the time, they were all doing scheduled. On demand means as soon as the order comes, it has They're to be picked to up and up. delivered immediately. Okay. So... And they couldn't offer that. So we knew we were going to do delivery ourselves. So we spoke mm. to a few other people. Um, and the only path forward was self-delivery. Uh, okay. So then we had to build the infrastructure. I remember just saying, okay, I'll just put this in a cooler, chuck it in an Okada and go. It was Boston Tijani, the, the, the CEO yeah. of uh, CC Hub, that actually was like, no, Timmy. Quality. Mm. We want to be known for quality. Mm. And immediately I got it. Yes, I want to be known for quality. Uh, and I remember the way I could understand it is you have this little boy. Whatever you cannot use for him, no one else in Nigeria should have to use it. We are all human beings. We are all God's children. And I also thought that 
my son in Nigeria deserved the exact same things that my nephews mm-hmm. in the US had. Um, and of course, it wasn't his fault that his mom is who and brought him, <laughs> brought him to Nigeria. Um, but yeah, so I decided, okay, quality. Okay. We're going to do state-of-the-art quality, American standard, you know, European standard quality. So we didn't really invest it in coaching. You know, we got a blood box, okay. we got a Bluetooth padlock, you know, we got temperature strips just to match the quality that you get. How did you find them? Hmm? How did you find them? Google. Okay. I Googled everything and I spoke to some of my, uh, so I'd made some friends in East Africa when I was working in Uganda. I remember okay. calling one of them and say, what do you know about coaching for blood? Okay. So they knew a lot about coaching for vaccines, but it could, you know, help me do some research and it sent me to go do the research. Okay. Gave me some keywords. There was a big WHO document that was almost like 150 pages. Uh-huh. I remember printing it out. Sorry, green energy people. <laughs> sorry, the green people. I'm very sorry. I remember going to a printing shop and printing up and binding in those okay. blue binders uh-huh. and then reading it. Okay. It was in there that I found all the things that I needed. Uh, okay. Uh, so I called. I remember so many people refused. Actually, the, the thing we use now were always not the first choices. Okay. Not because of quality, but because prices, okay. pricing, and etc. What we then, because they wouldn't want to ship anything to Nigeria. As soon as they heard that we were Nigerians. Why? Oh, I'm not sure. Mm. I'm not sure why people didn't. I think then was in the thro- the world was in the throes of anti-Nigeria and the, uh-huh. the fraud, etc. So they always thought that I was like, I'm gonna send you money. Like, no, we don't work with Nigeria. Wow. I remember one person who we actually end up using now. I'm not gonna say who it is. Made me send my American passport data page to him. Wow. Before he would do business with me, because I was like. In fact, one person stopped responding to us. And then when we started getting press, about a I year ago, he sends me a message. Of course, <laughs> I'm petty. I do good, but I got some petty. And I'm like, sorry, you're using your competitor now. You ignored my mail for three years because you thought I was in Nigeria. So now mm. we want, oh, he saw, oh, oh, you, I saw you in Newsweek. Mm. I saw you in BBC. <laughs> No, I want to do business with no, sir. No, <laughs> sir. Um, but yeah, people wouldn't do business with us. Okay. Um, in fact, one one of the products, I had to ship it to, was Bustle. I had to use someone else's account and ship it down to Bustle. Oh. Bustle, I think, in London. Okay. For it to now be brought back to Nigeria. to Nigeria. So it was like a convoluted, and thankfully... Again, organizing is my is what I like doing. So I was like, oh, yes, give it to me. I'm going to get it. And we had to go like, it was like almost convoluted, like mapping mm. how to get these products into the country. One time, some of our product was stuck in uh, customs. So we got, it was a big blood boxes. We got it in, it was stuck in customs because they were quoting the most ridiculous duty. Mm. Um, it was usually health products don't carry much less duty. Exactly. So we said, this is a health product. They said, oh, it's made with plastic. It carries 60% duty. No, it does not. <laughs> oh. Wow. Anyways, so we had to like basically push and finally we got it. We got it in um, late April. So everything okay. was now Same in the Same as country. when you got the blood bank as well, April. No, no, no. We got the blood bag before April. Okay. Yeah, it was before April. Okay. Our, first, we fr- our first order was in May. Okay. May 2016. Um, but we had gotten the blood bank that listed their products. Okay. But there was like about, I can't remember actually when we got the blood bank. Okay. But I know it was before we were ready the to average, actually move okay. because we now had to wait for demand. Uh, the hospital. The hospitals. Okay. So we got the blood bank and I remember my colleague who was dealing with blood banks at the time, I remember her saying that one day she went to a blood bank. If this was this blood bank was in um, Mushi. Okay. No, 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 it's all up. Sorry. It's, not okay. it's, it's all up. And she walked into the blood bank and the guy was like, you know, we're already working with something like this. I've been listing my products in this platform. I won't say their name for a year. 
and mm. nothing has sold from listening. I'm oh, just doing the okay. work. Nothing is coming out of it. They will be calling. They will be trying to get me to tell their product, but nothing comes. And he said, I don't want to do another one. You, are, yeah. you guys are all scams. Wow. And I was like, okay, that's weird. And then I said, he, she said to, her, to him, if you don't join this platform, you'll regret it. Hmm. I don't know why she said that. I don't know where it came from, but she said like, this is going to be the thing. If you don't join now, you're going to regret it. And he's still, you know, we still part of, we still work with him. Uh, okay. Um, and he said, okay, I'll give you some. So he listed some on the platform. Now it was very prominent. So she would then go to other blood banks and say, oh, did you know this person has died? Uh, okay. Don't be left out. So that person, they, then they all started coming. Interesting. Then they all started, and that was how we got like about 15. Ah, interesting. Before we even launched, we already okay. got 15 blood okay. banks. And it was the first quasi threat that says, if you don't join this, this is going to be big. Mm. If you don't join now, mm. you're going to regret it. And then he joined and, and that got all the, the people around him time. who knew him to join. Not because they were like, oh, he's showing leadership, but because they're like, ah, if, if money is to be made, <laughs> I want to be there mm, too. Okay. So that was how we got the first. Then hospitals came in. So we had actually signed up hospitals throughout waiting for this coaching. Okay. But we, we hadn't gotten our first order. So okay. by end of April, we were ready. Okay. We had our bike set up. We have the coaching equipment. Everything was ready. Then we got our first order. I remember it was an order to Lasso. This was when? This was May 2016. Okay. That was the first order, May 2016. Um, we actually, we don't celebrate January 2016 when, mm. we, were, when we were officially incorporated. Okay. It's May. Um, May 2016. When you got your first May order. Is when we got our first order. That's what we like to okay. celebrate. So we got our first order and that was it. And we've been going ever since. In just a moment, Tammy will be sharing her life lessons, inspiring moments, and times when she felt most alone shortly. Stay with us. I'm Oshaya, and you're listening to Origins Africa podcast. Hi there. Are you an entrepreneur, celebrity, innovator, executive, creator, religious leader, sportsman, or someone who's made and is making their dreams come true? and would like to share it on Origins Africa podcast, kindly send an email to originsafricapodcast at gmail.com or reach us via any of our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Origins AF. Your origin story matters. Let's inspire hope one story at a time. If you like what you've listened to hitherto, click the subscribe button. For sponsorships, donations, and adverts, please send an email to originsafricapodcast at gmail.com. Also share your thoughts and feedback with us on social media pages, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Origins AF. Don't forget to follow us. Welcome back to Origins Africa Podcast. So LifeBank was incorporated in 2016, and they had their first order in May. But what were the tough lessons Tami learned in the first year? I think that I underestimated how much of my emotional intelligence would be needed. Uh. I think I really quite underestimated. I thought for some reason that in businesses, everything is logical. Uh. That people somehow come to work and they become this hyper-logical, hyper-calm, hyper-focused versions of themselves. And I didn't realize that people bring themselves to work. Uh, Their emotions, if they had a fight the day before, no matter how much you're working in a business, you're going to be in a bad mood because you just had a, spouse, a, true, a fight with your true, spouse. True. So I think what was really surprising to me is how much of my time will be spent making sure that my team were fine and, and, and making sure that like the human side of things. I think mm -hmm. I underestimated how much of my time will be there. And mm -hmm. that was hard for me because I entered, I wanted to do life bank because I wanted to save lives. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that my daily life would be 
not directly saving lives, but actually building the structure that saves lives. And mm. that's really hard. Um, which is one of the first thing, as soon as we moved to this office, the first thing I did was have the names on the wall okay. because I really wanted to, we changed it recently. It used to be just in blocks. Okay. We wanted it to be hard because it's hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, because I wanted to constantly remember why the reason, the reason for it, uh, for, for what I do, because mm. I didn't want it to be just business it's an impact business. We call ourselves the business of saving lives. Mm. The business is important, but saving lives is the most important thing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So how do you make money? We make money by charging hospitals. So for every product we move to them, we charge them a fee. Okay. We have a cross subsidization model. Some hospitals pay a lot more and we give them different services. Okay. And some hospitals pay a lot less. Different services like? So you get a special, you know, extra security. Okay. So your product is moved in a special, you know, uh, you get temperature strips. Uh, um, everybody gets coaching, but different levels of coaching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when did LifeBank become profitable? We're not profitable yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're not profitable yet because we'll be focused on growth. Okay. Uh, so we're now in Lagos, Abuja, Potakot, um, heading to Kano next week to launch Kano. I'm interested. Um, <laughs> my team are actually there now. Our head of operations and the person who runs Abuja okay. um, is now in Kano. That's great. Uh, so we're going to do, we're going to be in four cities before the end of Q1. Mm. Um, we're also working on and Nairobi and Addis Ababa. My yeah, last my. year we launched in Addis Ababa, but we only launched our, our drone project yeah, in Addis. Yeah, I, I, I read that. Yeah. I read that. So now we're working on full operations in Addis. Okay. After this call, I have a lot of work to do on that. <laughs> How difficult or challenging is or has the expansion to other cities and countries oh, been, been from Lagos when you're setting it up? Yes. You know, when you are setting something up, so it's actually very similar. Okay. Because it's fresh everywhere you go. Um, setting up within Nigeria is now easy. I think we can do that within like a week. Okay. You know, we can, because now we know exactly how to do it. We know Nigeria very yeah. well. But setting up outside Nigeria has been a bit complex. Uh, and that's taken a chunk of my time. Um, and that's been a bit harder. Like, it just reminds me of when we were starting from afresh anyways. Yeah. Um because it's now, you now have to do a lot of troubleshooting. It's not, there are no systems we've built for understanding the peculiarities of those markets. Here now, we understand the peculiarities of those, of every, of every area in Nigeria. Okay. And we've been able to respond to that. So anytime we're moving, so let's say we're moving from um, Lagos to Ibadan. It's very similar culture, mm -hmm. very similar working culture. So then you already have some sort of like background, some sort of mental muscle okay. to deal with those issues that will pop up and you already have a system in place. Uh, but, you know, East Africa is a completely new, uh -huh. new, new play. Uh -huh. uh, but we think we're up to it and we're doing the thing. So Most definitely. you'll be hearing some news about our expansion plans. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, so how long, you have the initial capital from CC Help. Mm -hmm. How long did that take you until before you had oh, very four short. first man? Because I made I, I made the mistakes that most people made make when they're starting new. I bought things I didn't need. Uh, and then they had to be put in storage. This, uh, so I bought too much of one of the products we needed for coaching. So that took a chunk of our capital. Okay. Um, I then had to raise a bridge round. Then we finished the bridge round and I had to raise a seed round, which we did in 2018, January. Um, was getting investment easy? I don't think it's easy, but I don't think it's hard either. Okay. I think it's not hard if you're going. Okay. If you're already do, like we're three X in every year. So it's not, but it's hard because we're healthcare. People don't trust it. Sure. There's a lot of risk. So you have to explain it over mm -hmm. and over again. Um, and you have to be selective. So I think one of the things I do is I don't, I don't talk to tons of investors. Okay. I basically pre-select the person I want to work with. What do you look out for? Patience. Okay. Patience is the only thing I care about. Um, and if you look at a captive, you'll be shocked because there are some people on that captive who you think are not patient at all, but I've actually uh -huh. turned out to be the most patient. Um, and I think I want someone who also understands the dual bottom line. 
Uh, that at some point I'm going to make decisions that are best for the patient and not necessarily best for returns. Uh, and then I'm going to do that constantly. Uh, so if you are not somebody who gets that, the relationship is going to be strained. Uh, yeah. So for me, it's been really critical. Returns are important. I mean, again, I have to do something about my spa habits, right? Uh, um, so returns are critical for me and school fees is not cheap in Lagos. Um, at all. At all. <laughs> you okay? No, you're not good. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 yeah. Get your money up. Um, no, so I have to, yeah, I have to make sure returns happens. But here, when you're going downstairs, you see the list of values that we have at Life Bank. The first and most important one is you have to care. Uh. And we give the order of caring. Uh, it is patient. People, people mean in your colleagues at work, okay. life bankers, and uh, partners. Uh-huh. So in this order, all the time, patient first, always. Uh-huh. No matter what we do, patient first. Whatever we do has to be in the best interest of the patient. Uh-huh. Um, so it's really critical for us, and, and we really believe in it. So when I'm looking at investors, I'm looking, I'm basically optimizing for people who understand that. Okay, okay. Aside from buying a lot of products at the beginning, mm. what other mistakes would you say you oh, made, I made at the initial? Yes. Oh God, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, and I feel like one of the most important things around making mistakes is to understand that you're going to make them and to not let it stop you. True. And I think the biggest mistake I made is not actually making mistakes because I think that comes with the territory. Mm. But it's now losing my... There was a time around 2017, 2018. No, 2017, not 2018. I, I, I was over it by then. But for a chunk of time in 2017, I was consistently second-guessing myself. Uh. I couldn't make... It wasn't that I was making poor choices. I couldn't make a choice. Why? Because I was afraid of making poor choices. Uh. And I think what that has taught me is... You're going to make poor choices. Make them respond to them. Respond to the consequences of your poor choices quickly. But the worst thing you can do for yourself is to be unable to choose. Mm. And that's the worst mistake. Mm. So for me, I think what I did, the worst mistake I made was losing my my confidence, my self-confidence in, in being able to build a business. And I'm very happy that I got out of it. Did any particular thing happen to trigger the loss of that self confidence? Because I think when you started, you were able to make decisions. Yeah. Then in between, yeah. in 2017, yeah. you yeah. started to second guess yourself. What happened? I think people left. Some people, some pretty prominent people left. Your staff? Yes, okay. employees. Um, and not because, and they left not because they don't believe, but because of relationship issues, oh. which I could have solved. Oh. Yeah, if I had seen it earlier. And if I had responded to the issues they've had. Um, and I think that was the biggest one. Because when you're building a business, there's a thing about you feel like you get too close. Uh-huh. Like it's almost like a, like if you have a spouse and, you, and you're kidnapped together or something like uh-huh. that. There's a closeness that... Like if you, if you end up being in something pretty traumatic with somebody... There's just like a, a very and building a business is really is trauma. <laughs> Everybody who's running a business in this country should go to therapy. Like, guy, get your therapy then <laughs> up and running or speak to somebody because mm. it is traumatic. Uh-huh. Um yeah, so like for me, like not being able to getting so close to someone and not being able to save those relationships, particularly mm-hmm. in the context of work, when you know they believed in the business, is really tough. And mm-hmm. I think that that gave me some... And because I knew, and I'm pretty self-aware, I think there's one thing I don't like to tell me. <laughs> you lie to everybody, but I don't <laughs> like to tell me. Um, so I knew then that I messed up. Mm-hmm. They messed up a little bit, and I messed up a little bit as well. And because I had messed up, I just couldn't make good choice. I felt like I made poor choices with that relationship and I felt like I couldn't make good choices anymore. Mm. And I got stuck in. I was basically sitting on decisions 
four months and not making choices. And and I think that's probably the biggest mistake I've ever made. Mm, okay. And founders should watch out for it. Because mm, you think you're being careful. You're not being careful. You're, you're delaying. Eh? You're not able to make... It's like having PTSD mm, from founding. Mm, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So last year, mm. you went with Jack Ma... African Net Premium Prize. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. How did that feel? Oh, I worked for it. Mm. And I think it just basically reinforced everything I knew about myself. And I think it was one of those moments where you know, okay, this is me. I'm formed mm. now. I've always believed in working hard. And I worked hard. That pitch I knew offhand mm. I didn't need to look at anything I didn't need to check and the only way to know it offhand is to have practiced a thousand times and I practiced wow. a thousand times my assistant who traveled with me was amazing would say basically enter my she would come to my room around like 6am tell me wake up it was like a drill take it again wow I'll present it again and again Again, I'll do it. And again, I'll do it. I'll, again, I'll do it. Because I basically gave up. It was one week where we were in Accra. And again, and I'll do it again. Over and over. People would go, like the rest of, they kind of thought I was, I mean, one, I'm introverted. I don't mm. really like, I just like spas. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what I like I'm really good. So, really, and two the fire to it. Um, so, those are my thing. And, uh, so it doesn't really include anybody. Mm, so I'm mm, myself like a loner person. Mm. Um, and so they will all go out in the evening when we're done with, we have to do a lot of pre-function, a lot of pre-taping. So they'll go out, they'll hang out. And they're all amazing people, mm. fantastic leaders who I all respect. But for me, the business needed, you know, Somebody. we needed this, we needed money, we needed the experience, we needed, mm. I wanted to speak to Jack. Mm. And asking questions, you know, I was, I needed, I needed to be on that stage. And I remember before I told everybody to call me, take me 250. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Everybody that's like, do not call me, take me, <laughs> no, call me, take me, you know, because they, they shared the money. So you said 250 or 65 or mm. 150 or 100. Mm. I was like, I don't know. Just cuckoo call me, take me. Take me 250. There was a time where we had to do mock, um, mock uh, pictures okay like just to know your space and they handed me the the hundred i think it was a hundred that they handed no. i was like no uh, 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 i went to take they are not giving it i was like i, was like, I don't want this one give it. so i have pictures of myself with the check ah way before the final day because i was like i i was you could smell okay. the price. I was okay with not winning, but I knew that if I didn't win, it would not be because of me. It would not be because of me. You didn't give me your best. I needed to live with losing. Mm. And the way that I live with losing is if I know that I tried everything that I could have mm. and I lose, okay. It, mm. it, will, it will stink, but at least... And it sounds like cliche, but it's really true. If you do everything you were supposed to do, you will have no regrets. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, true. true, true. I, so I really practiced. Mm. One, a thousand times. And my ass, she's really amazing. Aisha is really amazing. But she's more like like the boss. <laughs> like, again, I'll do it. Again, I'll do it. Again, I'll do it. Again. Oop. Over and over again. Over and over and over again, I practiced. And um, you yeah, won. it was really good. What's the most important thing winning did for you? I think the most important thing, I mean, apart from being famous now mm -hmm. <laughs> and meeting Jack Ma, <laughs> I will Most tell buzz. you the name that I call him because that would not go well. Okay. Um, but like being able to talk to, you know, Joe Tsai mm -hmm. and hear his expertise, somebody who had been a CFO of Alibaba for so long, mm -hmm. meeting my business hero, Jack Ma, mm -hmm. um, Meeting Mrs. Awoshika, who I've always looked up to as an African woman who had built something really amazing and who had a happy family, mm. you know, happy children, happy mm. husband, which is really pretty important to me. I think being able to hear from the three of them was really critical and were really important. 
But I think the thing that did it for me is self-confidence. Mm. I think for me, not self-confidence in like Tammy is awesome. She is. <laughs> but, but self-confidence in that if I worked hard, I may just win. Mm. Like if I did the work and yeah, I may just win. Mm. Because I mean, I've, I've lost a lot of things. No, a lot of people, you, you don't get to hear, I haven't lost a couple recently, but you don't get to hear the things you've lost, things people have lost. And I have, I've, I've, I've really lost a lot of competition. So I always knew that it, it doesn't matter. And I've judged competitions. So I know it's mm-hmm. not just excellence that you also have to have a bit of luck that somehow your story has to resonate with the stories of the judges mm-hmm. for it's really for you to be selected. True. So I understand that. So you may not win even if you're awesome, but at least be awesome, right? So I think for me, that gives me self-confidence that the trick, the key mm. to always, not always winning, the, the key to winning, even if you don't get the cash and you don't get the prize, but the key to winning, which is even if you lose the prize, you'll still feel good with yourself. The trick to winning is to do the work. Mm. And I like doing the work. Mm. So I think that's what I feel more confident that I can do anything. I feel this was, it was after Jackman that I started telling people publicly about what I want to do with Life Bank. Mm. Because I always knew since day one, but I never told anybody because Why? I always felt like people would be like, <laughs> really, you're going to list on the London Stock Exchange, mm. a tiny company moving blood around. How, sis? Mm. How? I used to tell myself that. Like, how is that going to happen? Do you know the rules? Do you know? You cannot do it. But I always knew that I'm, this is the goal. This mm. is my goal with Life Bank. I want to list this thing. I want to have an IPO and I want it to be awesome and big and amazing. Until this, until the Jack Ma thing, and it wasn't because of Jack Ma, it wasn't because of the press. It was simply, if you know, the, if you know what you need to do, and you do it, and you do the work, you can IPO. Mm. So I think it gave me confidence to actually open my mouth, and I told my board after, when we had a Q4 budget meeting, I told them this is exactly what I'm trying to do with Life Bank. Mm. I told everybody, I put it on my Twitter, I put it on my Instagram. So everybody wow. knows. I said, from Lagos to LSC, eh? take me to the world. <laughs> wow. So I started saying it and I'm owning it. And I'm That's owning great. that big, audacious, airy mm. dream. Mm. And I didn't do that in the past. Mm. I was always like, oh, it's a tiny company. It is a tiny company right now, but it's going to get big. And, and the only path forward is to just do the work. That's great. Yeah. Would you say that was your most inspiring moment on this journey? Or no. was that so what was the most inspiring moment for you? Most inspiring moment is literally any time. Okay, so we launched a product called Boat by Life Bank. Yeah, I was gonna get that, but All that's right. good. So right. let's talk about it. Blood Oxygen Access Trust. I remember when we launched somebody who I think should know better had written that or oh, does that mean that Life Bank's business model is broken if they had mm. to launch a not for profit arm? Mm. I was really upset. I was in a hotel room in the world somewhere when I read that article and I was so angry and I was so hurt by that story because it's not true. But they didn't know. So I've always felt like shaky about boots since that writing because I didn't want everybody to think that Life Bank is now morphing into an NGO and no, 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 their business. And I think that was sort of like the implication of what that person wrote. So I was really upset about it. So I've always felt mm, a bit strange about boots. I know that it was needed. I know it's awesome, uh. but I've never been like super like pushy about it until. So one day we had to do shoot. It was actually for Jack Man. They had to do a pre-shoot. Okay. So they wanted to go to, they had gone to a very fancy hospital that we work with because we work with everybody. Like the best hospital in Lagos, we were working with them, all of them. And the poorest hospital in Lagos with no electricity, <laughs> we're working with them. So it's really, really like, so we went to, so they wanted to see that. So we went to a hospital on Snake Island. Okay. And... In this island, 
there is no electricity. Mm. Um, it's a tiny little island. They don't have electricity. There's no electricity drawn to the island. So the hospital doesn't have light, except for they put on the generator. So I remember entering that hospital. Now, before, before, the, the, before this trip to, this, to the island, it was my first time there. We had been working for the, with them for like six months. We had helped a girl who had had some sort of complication with childbirth. And she ended up needing nine bags of blood and the most powerful antibiotics ever because she had had a pregnancy that was rotten inside. So her mom, uh, uh, she was being raised by a grandmother who basically we sold fish that the fisherman found. Mm. She would smoke it and then sell it. Mm. Very low income. A bag of blood is uh, about 15K. Mm. 20, 15 to 20K. She needed six. Nine. Nine, rather. So, and she needed the most expensive, I think. The antibiotics she had to use was about 50,000 naira. Wow. So, without both by life bank, she was going to die. That's mm. it. Because the doctor even says that usually what he would have done is if she realizes he can give his own services for free, but he's not going to go and steal blood to give these patients. So, he normally gives his services for free to these destitute patients. But once he realizes there's no cost, there's no funding to buy the necessary things he needs, he packs them up, makes them comfortable, gives them painkiller, sends them out to die. Wow. And that this is what he does all the time. And before this moment, there was no one helping him. And we were the only one, both. I'd never met this girl. They had told me about our story. The person who runs the boats in Life Bank had told me. I had approved all the budgets to pick out, but I never met her. So she was not real in my head. She was a story. I don't know why the doctor did it, but he had her and her grandmother waiting for me oh. in the hospital. It was the first time I don't, because of the nature of what we do, we don't get to see patients. We just drop off the blood and leave. So although we know their names, we don't get to meet them. But he had the patient waiting for me in the hospital. This was a great grandma. Like this was, I mean, a grandma. She was like old, old, old. And if you're Yoruba, you know. Like when I entered, she just knelt. Wow. The grandma. She knelt and she was crying and she just stood there looking at me and was just kneeling down. And as I said, when you're Yoruba, you have an old lady kneeling yeah, in, front in front of, front of you. Of it was the best moment of my life. Wow. And Jack Ma, you know, on the stage, it's nice. Mm. Um, traveling all over the world, it's nice speaking. I got to go to Davos last this year. That's nice. Nothing, nothing comes close to that moment in the middle of nowhere in Lagos, standing there in front of this 70 year old lady kneeling in front of you. Mm. Because I had an idea, and I didn't, I didn't let fear stop me. I didn't let the poor opinion of other people kill the project. And um, I did it, and a child survived. Mm. I think she was about nineteen years old. Wow. She survived and she's alive today because because of both, because of Life Bank, because of this amazing company that we've built. So I think if there's a moment, my proudest moment is that moment. Not Mama. Not Jack Ma, not not any of that. I, I mean I love it. Who doesn't love it? <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. Um, but it's those moments that matter. Now do you talk about boot? I go, oh my god. <laughs> both buy life bank. Both buy life bank. Both buy life bank. It's saving lives, guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. When have you felt most alone in this journey? <sighs> I mentioned we've run, run out of money. We've almost run, well, we actually have run, run out of money. And one day was a day. And it, alone is hard because I have my husband who's an incredibly supportive mm. partner. Um and I have my amazing team. Uh-huh. We're always there. You know, I get a lot of like, sometimes they say, don't tell your team. What's some companies, some CEOs like to hide things from their team. 
as soon as there's a problem, I call all of them. This is the problem uh, we have uh, because you know I don't hide. They know everything uh, that's happening with this company. So it's really I, I really feel alone. Uh, it's hard. It's difficult to be the leader because a lot of people look up to me, but I don't think it makes me feel alone because I know they're on my side, uh, and I know my husband is at home and is on my side. Um. But I think there was a day we 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 ran out we ran out of money, and I remember I borrowed personally from a friend, and the friend wanted her, her money back. Wow! And she had to say something. Wow! And I felt it was a sum. Yeah. She had to tell about people who. who I think it was the hardest price I've ever had to pay for running Life Bank. The few it was the it was the lowest I've ever felt. Uh-huh. Like the I felt I never confirmed if she was referring to me. But it was like I'm really private, I'm really self-contained. I don't want any I don't want to need anybody's help, but I needed her help because I needed to pay my people in life bank and I borrowed and I couldn't pay her back quickly enough and I was humiliated uh-huh. I was humiliated I felt low it was the worst and the most alone and the most terrible the lowest moment of building life bank so if and here's the trick about building businesses it's the human relationships that I actually remember the highest was you know an old lady uh, saying old thank lady you the lowest now. was a friend saying people that who are this, 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 this. Uh-huh. I think it was something like, how can you hold someone and still be tweeting, go and walk, that sort of something like that. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, and I felt really horrible. So I would say of all the moments, and there are so many of them like that, of all of them, I think is the one that sticks out the most uh-huh. as the lowest I've ever felt. Not alone, because I wasn't alone even this. Even the way to solve it was I had to had to be gently made. Okay. And my husband, you know, helped out. You know, my team member rallied. Wow. They took a pay cut, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Temporary. They got their money back. <laughs> but you know, took a you know, gave me the, the space to make to, to, to get everything together and they were very gracious about it. Uh. Of course it wasn't up to a month, but you know, I was able to pay her back and still figure things out and I think that so it wasn't a loneliness it was low, low mm. the lowest I've ever felt yeah and there have been days you felt like giving up oh, every other day <laughs> 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 it's the hearts on the world that keep me going mm. because funny enough I get you know I you know I get a lot of job offers wow from all over the world I don't know why people keep doing that like guys stop <laughs> Stop tempting me, guys. <laughs> but no, seriously, I get job offers like all the time. What was the most tempting offer you had to Oh, declare? I can't tell you. <laughs> that is really good. It was really, I was like, Jesus, God, why, why, why are you doing this to me? Mm. And I remember it was also like outside Nigeria. Okay. And funny enough, like my husband had recently I decided to go do something in mm. that same country. Oh, it would have been perfect. <laughs> I actually told my team, I was like, I'm facing Oh, you told them? No, I told them. Wow, okay. I said, I've made my decision, which is to stay. Mm. Because again, Nigeria seems to be my Robben Island. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I yeah, I get a lot of job offers. So I'm constantly tempted to leave. Um, but you know, when you're doing something you're really focused on, that this is, your, this is my life's work. What else am I going to do? Uh, what else would be as impactful, as interesting, as so changing as this business? Nothing else. Uh, so I always come back to that. No matter how tempted I am, there was a time where everybody in my life seemed to be moving to Canada. I don't know what it is. Like all of a sudden it was like a six month period in 20, early 2019 where I felt like everybody I knew was moving to Canada. It was the weirdest thing. Family members, uh, uh, cousins, aunts, best friends, big, you know, people who had like major careers. Uh, all of a sudden I was like, what, what's happening? You know? And um, 
Yeah, so I'm constantly tempted. Those that period was also difficult mm. because you always just feel like, okay, so what I why am I still why am I still there? here? Like, and and it's even worse for me because it's my choice. Mm. If you don't have any choice, yeah, exactly. Like, at least you don't have any choice. You know, everybody in my family has a choice, and we have a we have two countries we can live in outside Nigeria perfectly without mm. needing extra permission and. You know, we keep making this choice because it's the right thing to do. It's my, I feel like it's my duty to solve this problem. I've started it and I'm going to say it through. What are your fears today? Mm. That I make, this is really vulnerable, it's probably the most vulnerable I feel. I think my fears are that I made. I've made a choice that's good for the world, but bad for my son. Mm, bad for your son. Mm. That I've made a choice to solve a problem and live in a country that is not in his best interest. Mm. That's it. Wow. That's my fear. Yeah. We'll see. Let's hope he doesn't <laughs> when it goes old. Hopefully. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. I mean, Nigeria is a difficult place to raise children. It's good in some ways, but you don't have parks, you, you don't have museums. And, you know, in the UK, you have the Natural History Museum, the Museum of the Science Museum, this museum, this museum that children can go. They learn, you broaden their horizons. You have places where they can feed dogs. Mm. You know, there are parks everywhere. You know, on, almost like on every other street, you have parks. You can hear birds mm. flying. There are trees. Have you ever seen a tree in Lagos? When was the last time you saw a tree in Lagos? Think about it. <laughs> if you fly and you have entry in Lagos, it's brown. Tree. There are no trees. Where is the green? Please, where is the green? So anyway, that's, those are the things. It's not, those are the things that most concern. I love the education system here. I love the fact that you can get great people helping you with your family when you're a busy worker, um, when you're like a CEO of a company. So I think what, what really bothers me is, is the fact that public, mm. public life, public amenities are very, are mm. very so much missing mm. in this our country. And yeah, that's hard. Okay. Mm. So today you've been able to save over 7,000 lives yes. and move over 20,000 products. Yes. Do you feel fulfilled? No. Mm. I only feel fulfilled when no woman bleeds to death mm. while she's having a baby. So it's still a long way to go. What personal habits do you have that you would say have been instrumental? Focus. And great. Great. Mm-hmm. I'll focus. I'm able to ignore everything else but the thing in front of me, the company in front of me, the family in front of me. If I get home, I'm a mom, I'm not a CEO. And it's completely, Life Bank is dead mm-hmm. to me as soon as I'm in my house. Mm-hmm. I'm just a mother. And as soon as I enter this company, my kids are gone. I'm a CEO. So it's that focus, being able to ignore external things uh, that I think. D- it's very good for me and great. Mm. I have a capacity for suffering that most people don't have, particularly having to lose spa dates. <laughs> so when you, you should back- title this interview, the spa. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look back on the journey, what's the most important <laughs> lesson you've learned? Don't wait for permission. Mm. And that's it. Okay. Whatever dream you have, whatever. whatever whatever it is, no one is gonna give it to you. That's that's just the reality. You may think that they are, mm. but they're never gonna give you permission to follow your dreams. You don't need it. You don't need it. And it, I see, I feel, and I sense a lot of people do. Mm. Um, if you if you have now found, if you've not found the thing that brings you alive, okay, maybe. If you found it. Never let anybody take it from you. Even if you're scared, even if you have doubts. Even, even if they threaten, even if they leave, 
being alive and not alive as in you're breathing. Being alive. I don't know how else to say, but being alive is worth all of it. So don't stop. If you found something that brings you alive, do it. Okay. Um, how do you unwind? I I you books. mentioned you like to work a lot. And Please don't spas. mention books. Okay, spa as well. Spas okay. And books. I know people say books all the time. But honestly, the first thing I download on a new phone is Kindle. Uh-huh. I'm a reader, lifelong reader. I'm not a writer. I don't, I've never wanted to be a writer. Some people want to be. Mm-hmm. I'm a reader. I was meant to read. Okay. So I read and I go to spas. Would you um, ascribe your success to your hard work and skills or to luck? A little bit of both. Okay. Both equally. Yes. I'm lucky to... I've told you about the breaks. Yes, the privileges. Yeah. I'm lucky to have had my mom win the lot the lottery. Literally, she won the lottery. Mm-hmm. Um, if she had not won, maybe I would still be here. I mean, in the next 20 years, I'll get here. But it accelerated my growth. So that's a lucky break. I'm lucky that I am focused. I didn't do anything to, to have that personality trait. I'm lucky that I like to organize and I like to work. Some people don't have that. That's luck. I didn't do anything to get it. Mm. Um, so anything that I have that I don't work for, I feel like it's a lucky break. Okay. And there are tons of it. I'm lucky that I have a healthy child. If you had been sick, I wouldn't have been able to come back. Mm, Mm? I'm lucky I have a good marriage that makes me feel like I can fly. Mm. Well, actually, that one is not lucky because I chose him. (laughs) 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 I made a choice there. That's all me. Um, No, but uh, yeah, like I feel like I'm lucky. In so many parts of my life. So I hear more luck than hard work or... Oh, yeah, but I work 14 hour days. Mm -hmm. And you need both. Okay. Even if I'm... I mean, there are many people who have all the things that I've just mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. And they're not where I am. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes, There are many people who are luckier. I mean... But like rich people have kids. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they don't make much of their life. Okay. So I think it's both. What should we look forward to from Life Bank in the next few months? Growth, 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 and the LSE. And what? LSE. LSE. London Stock Exchange. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> growth and the LSE. If you wear my shoes, mm-hmm. what would you ask yourself that I haven't? <sighs> Nothing. <laughs> you got everything out of me. Oh my god! Uh, seriously, yeah. I thought about it and it's nothing. I mean, I was thinking fear. That's done. Blog. That's done. People that do talk about. Yeah, I'm oh. a great interview. We a great interview. So it was a bit of a okay. So, yeah. who would you like us to interview next? Oh, so many people. Okay, top um, three. Top three. Ezra Ulubi. Okay. He's the uh, co-founder of Paystack. I think he's an interesting guy. Okay. Um, Billy Kiss. Okay. Who used to run with Cypher. Who used to? Who, actually, well, I'm not sure what she does now, but she was, she founded we cyclers we cyclers we cyclers okay yep. Billy Kiss and in fact you can interview them together Billy Kiss and Wally at the BE okay um, they, Wally runs we cyclers now we cyclers is uh, a recycling company okay it's a pretty interesting model I think you should speak to them okay and I was gonna say collar to bosom, but I was yes, gonna say I was gonna say collar to bosom, but okay. I feel like that sounds like <laughs> So why collar to bosom? I think he's led a very interesting life. Okay. I think yeah, I think his life has I mean, I've been part of it. <laughs> for, for six years. Eight years. No, 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 ten years. We've been together for ten years. Um but I think he's an interesting man. Yeah. Okay. I think it's really different. Um, 
I think that he's doing really interesting things with language. Mm. Um, he calls himself the, the defender of African languages. Mm. Um, so I think he's done a lot of different things there. Um, I think he's turned a dot degree. Uh, supposedly dot degree to an amazing lucrative career. Mm. So he studied linguistics. You okay. know. How many famous linguistics do you know? Mm. Exactly. True. True. Except for that one, um, Chomsky. <laughs> is was, no, I'm Chomsky. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I think he's led a really pretty interesting life, and, okay. and I think it could be really interesting to listen to to him. I think your audience will learn a lot from him. That was Tammy Giwatsubosa. She's the CEO and founder of LifeBank. Thanks so much for listening to our show this week. You can subscribe at wherever you get your podcast, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, amongst others. And whilst you're there, please do give us a review. You can also write to us at OriginsAfricaPodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to send a tweet, it's at OriginsAF. We would love to hear from you about how we're doing and where you'd like us to improve. Join us next time as we have a chat with Teniola Sego, co-founder and creative director at Clan, creative director at House of Diola. You think that you've done so well. Like you tell yourself, wow, amazing. This is me. I've done New York Fashion Week. So that's me and my sisters. And you come back home and instead of people here to be like, ah, oh, well done. People are actually trying to, you know, change the, the scene, trying to put Lagos on the map. We're hearing what nonsense is this? My Tiloka, so this. Uh, Who do they think they are? Is it because they're Dola Sego's daughters? And it's- Our show was produced this week by Tomishi Ajani whilst the theme song was composed by Just Ritimi. I'm Oshaya, and you've been listening to Origins Africa podcast. Bye for now. Whatever you do, don't back down when things get tight. Keep the drive, keep the faith, stay